All right, good evening, one and all. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it's The Drinker here, and I'm joined this evening by the one and only Doomcock, uh, the future ruler of Earth. He's taken some time out of planetary conquest to, to join me and chat a little bit about, well, one of the greatest action-adventure franchises that's ever been created, really. It's Indiana Jones. Uh, man, when you suggested this, I was just so pleased. <laughs> like I've been waiting to talk about these movies forever, and yeah, you've just given me the perfect opportunity, man. So thank you for suggesting it, and thank you for coming on the stream tonight to do this. I could not be more delighted. It's an honor. It's been too long, my friend. Uh, it's always one of my favorite things to do to sit with uh, such an erudite and knowledgeable gentleman who also uh, <laughs> has a liver similar condition to mine. Uh, and of course, you being in your time zone, me being in my time zone, it uh, gives me a great excuse to drink in the afternoon uh, and talk about uh, some of my favorite things in the world. I was delighted. Uh, I figured you had uh, probably talked about this long ago. And I was like, well, if you haven't talked about it, I sure would, would love that. And uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, in my humble opinion, not so humble opinion, is uh, one of the truly greatest films ever made, period. Uh, yeah. It's a masterpiece from first frame to last. It's it, it's fantastic. And, you know, what we're going to do tonight, uh, you and I, is we'll, we'll do our best to go through each of the movies in turn, um, even Crystal Skull, and <laughs> talk a bit about them. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, um, we, we can maybe finish up and give our thoughts about, uh, you know, how excited we are for Indiana Jones 5. Um, <laughs> we'll save that for the end. Though. Yes, at the very end. <laughs> as people uh, flee for the exits. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, I mean... Obviously, where better to start, really, than than um, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Just, um, I, I think it was great is that these movies were inspired by the kind of adventure serials that George Lucas watched as a kid, um, and it, it's proof positive that you can take classic older ideas like that, um, and you can you can repackage them so that they're they're um, enjoyable for like the current day. Um, and it still works. Like these elements of of like globe trotting adventures, looking for hidden treasure and avoiding traps and and all that stuff. Those are like great universal ideas that just like every generation can enjoy. Absolutely. You know, when when Lucas uh, kind of came up with this, he wanted to do a movie that was all the good parts. You know, like you always say, oh, that was the good part of this movie. That was the good part of that movie. Well, this is a movie where every bit of it is the good parts and uh when i when i first i i i saw this uh at a at a sneak preview actually uh it was like uh i was one of the first people to to see it when i was a kid Damn. and uh you know just looking at the poster i didn't quite i didn't know what the hell it was going to be it looked like this old bum like he looked like a farmer to me like like you know he had like that <laughs> yeah. you know the whip around his shoulder looked like he was maybe pulling a plow or something and i thought what is this some kind of mice and men kind of you know steinbeck thing but okay i'll look at it and uh the moment that i knew that we were in for something incredibly special was when they're tracking along and then they they rack focus on this dart sticking out of the tree and and the two guys come, you know indiana Jones, you see and you haven't seen his face that's one of the great things about this. This the opening. reveal, yeah, the reveal. Oh. But he he pulls he pulls out the the dart. And he rubs it with his finger, lets it casually drop, and they scramble like bums for an extra cigarette button. Pick it up. Uh, um, are near. Poison still fresh. Three days. They are yeah. following us. If they knew we were here, they would be. We would be dead already. It's just <laughs> wow. And I'm like, oh shit. Oh shit! This is this is gonna be amazing, uh, and and it was. Oh my god! Um, I mean, you get the um, you know, Indies in shadow, and um, you know, I think one of his one of his uh, guides like reaches for a weapon, and Indy just goes for the bull whip and like whips it out of his hands, um, and like he runs off into the jungle, and then in, that's when Indy comes out of the shadows there, and you just see Harrison Ford's face, and like the the whole. The whole getup of Indiana Jones is just iconic. You know, the the leather jacket, the the fedora hat, the bullwhip, all of these things. Just like a classic old fashioned adventurer, um, and he just looks awesome. Like you can't you can't beat that kind of look that Indy's got. 
Oh no, the look on Harrison Ford's face when he emerges, the the gleam in his eye, the the sense of danger of the man. Uh it's one of the great reveals of of film history. There are two others that come to mind, Drinker. Uh one of them is in Dr. No, uh yes. where you yeah. know, uh you know the the beautiful woman uh, Sweeby, Sweeby. Uh you know, I, I we need another 10,000 francs. I admire your courage, Mish. And, and she says, I admire your luck, mister. And then we see his face as he has a cigarette dangling from his mouth. He says, Bond, James Bond. Yeah. And, and that music kicks in. And the other great one is Casablanca. Yes. Uh, where, you know, uh, we haven't seen Rick Blaine. Uh, all we see is this guy comes in, uh, gives him this check. And he, he, you see his hands. He takes it. He writes, okay, Rick, and hands it back. And then he, he has a chess piece and a drink and a cigarette. And he he, uh, he 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 taps the top of the chest piece, picks up the cigarette, and then the camera tilts up with his with his cigarette to his face, and you can just tell from the look on his face exactly what kind of man he is, and uh, the cynicism, the 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 world weariness. I mean, those are three great moments in in cinematic history in terms of reveals. I don't know any other ones that are as good as those. I mean, yeah, I, I think um, those pretty much cover it. They're they're all iconic in their own way. And yeah, I think it's just a great way to establish Indy as a character. Like straight away, you know, this is a guy who's ready for danger. He's accustomed to, to um, you know, people betraying him. He knows about poison darts and everything. Like he, this is a guy who can handle himself in dangerous situations. And so you immediately understand that about him. Um, and yeah, like I say, the the look and everything is great. Uh, I I just love the the whole like entrance into this this temple that he's he's got to infiltrate. Um, you know the bit where they go through the the webs, and you know <laughs> his his friend is like, uh, I, you know, sorry, his assistant Alfred Molina is like, ah, I, Senor, and he's got he's got spiders, big giant tarantulas like all down his back. You know, and he's, he just uses the whip to like get them off because you know, again, Indy's not scared by stuff like that. He can he can just do it, um, and you know, it's a it's just a perfect sequence, drinker. I mean, it's it's there is more excitement and and genuine cinematic bravura in that uh, ten minute intro than in a lot of other movies. Yeah, this was like a movie within a movie almost, wasn't it? Yeah. It's got everything you want. You know, he's, he's, he finds the golden idol. Uh, you know, you've got, he gets his way through the traps with like spikes coming out of the walls with skeletons attached to them. Like, <laughs> there's always skeletons <laughs> in these movies. I know uh, when he when he waves his hand in front, stop, stay out of the light, and then he waves his hand cautiously, and it, oh, oh, the guy's screaming, and the, yeah. and the head of the the body rotates, and he looks and says, "Forest dog." Because at yeah. the beginning, remember, he says, this is it. This is where Forrestal cashed in. A friend of yours, a competitor. He was yeah. good. He was very, very good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, it's just perfect, man. It, narratively, it's just so brilliant. It, it's Spielberg at like his finest, honestly. I don't think he was ever better in terms of his uh, directoral flair, his economy. Uh, the editing is uh, just just beautiful uh as opposed to temple of doom which we will talk about later which i think uh didn't run the same balance of uh you know uh you know quieter moments with adventure moments it was all just you know endless yelling and screaming and, yeah, and, and shooting I, I, and stuff I, I it's interesting you say that i've got, definitely got things i want to say about temple of doom man oh but, yeah yeah we'll, <laughs> we'll get to it i'm sorry but but, but the, the thing about indie raiders is it's never boring but it def definitely has rhythms and beats, and I think it flawlessly uh, escalates. Uh, I mean, it it, it just uh, you know builds and builds and builds, and it never crosses the threshold where, to me, it became unbelievable or uh, excessive. I, I think, uh, yeah, like it, it does a really good job of um, you know introducing all these different factions that are competing against Indy. Um, it. it it introduces that real sense of wonder. And what I love as well is the sense of menace that you get from this. Um, it, it starts out quite early on because you get the, the whole temple chase scene at the beginning. And it's really just to set up Indy as a character. You know, you, he gets the golden idol. And I love that scene where he's, he's trying to 
balance the amount of sand that needs to go into the bag to to weigh it down and he grabs it and he thinks he succeeded and then you know everything starts <laughs> collapsing around him and the fucking like the boulder chases him uh again it's just such a cool scene you know how goofy it is obviously it's all you know it's all on a sound stage but it's so fun it doesn't matter uh, and I, I always love in movies like this where there's a door closing. You know, there's always a big, like, stone door that's right. slowly going down. And, you know, you've only got a few seconds to get through it, but you have to make a choice about what you're going to do. And, yeah, you know, you get that there where he, he has to toss the the, the um, idol to his, his associate, to Alfred Molina, who runs away with it and fucks him over. But he still makes it out anyway. Um, and eventually he escapes. You know, it's all, it's all just a great sequence, like you say. That 10 minutes of the movie is just... You know, not a, not a second is wasted. But it really, is. I mean, when when he gets impaled on the same spikes that uh, got Forrestal, just a different set. He says, "Adios, Pedro." Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and then he's running and he leaps out of the cave and rolls and and, and sits up covered with webs and dirt. And then there's all the Jovitos with their spears raised, and uh, the camera like it goes over to you know. Uh, uh, Alfred, uh, no, the other guy uh, that that ran off that tried to shoot him first, and he yes. falls forward with all. He's the, got like the, yeah, he's got like twenty darts in his body. all the darts, and and the camera <laughs> tilts down, and then you see these very polished boots walk past, and it and it pans over, and there's the boots, and there's Indiana Jones looking up at this guy, uh, Doctor Jones. <laughs> yeah, uh, and there's Belloc, and it just Belloc, seamlessly yeah. goes. Uh, right into the next the next bit. Yeah, and what I love as well is then you you then get to see Indy in his home environment where he's a history professor at a university. Mm -hmm. You know, he's very very academic, very bookish. He's got the glasses on. He's out of the 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 adventurer get up, and he's just in a suit. And what's great about Harrison Ford is he can play both of those aspects of the character perfectly. You know, when you look at him, you very much buy into this idea that he's just this this kind of goofy history professor. Um, and he's never he's never been out in the field in his life, and that that's great. That's the hallmark of how good an actor he is, and how well they've written him. Um, and I think is is this in the one <laughs> the 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 girl in the class is written like love you on her eyelids. <laughs> she closes her eyes and he, and he interrupts, <laughs> and he kind of stammers, and he looks, and he's all flustered. And uh, and that's a key uh, character thing. I think with Indiana Jones that I think they kind of lost track of later that he wasn't necessarily entirely a ladies man. Uh, you know, he's not, uh, he's, he's taken a little aback by this. And, uh, and, and when the class lets out, you know, he's, he's given them instructions. And one thing that always makes me laugh is this one dork uh, puts an apple on his desk as he walks yeah. out, <laughs> yeah. which I just think is, it's just a one that, that film is so full of little touches, little moments like that. Uh, they were clearly having fun, and uh, and so the audience has fun, and 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 fun is something that we are severely strapped for in cinema today. Just fun. Those things were magical, and that's why even today we're talking about it and getting a glow, just remembering how good those films were. Yeah, I mean, it's um, yeah, it, it's just it's a different era of filmmaking, I think, and like Spielberg when he was at his best. Um, and Lucas, when he was at his best, like they were just pumping out absolute classics, and it's it's a joy to watch films like that because you know, like now, go looking back, yeah, that that was a uh, an era that didn't last for for all that long, and we we may not see it again. Who knows? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, with corporate, uh, you know, playing it safe and the bean counters and the woke wankers and everything else, it's just. Uh, Ah oh, man, it, it's it's it, the inspiration uh, is gone, and yet uh, you know, in weird little places, uh, you you do uh, excellence. You know, uh, life finds a way, as Jeff Goldblum said in in Jurassic Park. And uh, every once in a while, you get excellence that finds a way. Like for instance, I don't know if you've seen the uh, the latest uh, Star Wars Visions uh, anime episode one, the duel. Uh, no, I haven't seen that yet. I, I've heard about it. Um... Four, 14 minutes of pure excellence, uh, just playing into the old tropes of the Ronin and, uh, you know, the man with no name. Uh, it manages to be uh, uniquely Star Wars and Kurosawa meets uh, George Lucas and, and Japan. It's just, uh, 
it's 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 remarkable and mm. you know so yeah. excellence can survive but it's rare it's rare these days yeah it feels like it but it, you know when we look back now like that era um back in, when raiders was around and like well all the indie movies really um there were so many classics that came out of that period mm -hmm. you know and it just feels like that we were spoiled back then and we just we don't quite get that now um but and yeah, I like don't, the, and I don't think. I mean, I, I I agree with you, and I I don't think it's just nostalgia. I mean, looking back and analyzing these films as we're you know about to do, uh, I mean, we can make a solid case, an intellectual case, uh, as well as a visceral case for just how brilliant these films were. Uh, for example, uh, you know, when, when we get to it, I'm not trying to jump ahead, but I, I do want to talk about the ending of Raiders of the Lost Ark because it 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 tells you a lot about storytelling in general and uh and 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 why it works is is i think an important lesson for aspiring uh storytellers yeah no i'm looking forward to to get into that there's 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 so many aspects of this film that'll be good to talk about but um yeah i mean the gist here is that indy gets approached by marcus brody who's like the curator of his museum and um there's a couple of government men there who are asking indie questions about the Ark of the Covenant, which obviously, you know, each of the movies deals with a different religion. And, you know, in this case, it's Judaism. The next one is, I think, Hinduism. Um, and then mm -hmm. the Last Crusade is obviously Christianity. Um, in this case, it's the, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, they believe that the, the Germans, the Nazis, are seeking out this, um, this Ark. You know, they, they mentioned that Hitler is obsessed with the occult and... Uh, when they look back through their history books, like the, the Ark used to be a weapon that could be carried at the head of armies. And it's this terrifying, um, you know, we force of destruction, basically. Nobody quite understands it. Um, and so they want Indy to help find it. Um, and what's great is like straight away, the movie starts laying these hints on you that um, this is not something that you want to mess with. Like, I think... Indy's all getting ready to, to pack his bags and head out, and Marcus Brody approaches him and says, you know, something like that men have been looking for the Ark for a thousand years, and, um, you know, it's it's maybe not something that we want to find. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a dangerous thing. Are you sure you want to go looking for this? And Indy is not a believer in any of that stuff. He's not a superstitious man. He's not a religious man. And so he just dismisses it as like it's hocus pocus. You know, he's not, he's right. not worried about that. He just sees it as a, it's a piece of archaeology that he can recover. That's what he's interested in. And so There's, he. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I, I, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, which is a huge problem with Temple of Doom being a prequel. Uh, yeah. That Indy doesn't <laughs> yeah. Uh, believe you in really the supernatural. You really should believe in. Yeah, you should believe in magic, Indy. Just but, what you went through. <laughs> but one of my favorite moments in the movie is is when uh, they open up the the uh, book in in the meeting with the G men, and and they show a picture of the ark, and the, and he says, "Good God!" And he says, "Yes, that's just what the Hebrews thought." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's but, it's awesome, man. Yeah, but this is again. This is what I, I like about this movie that um, straight away you you start to understand that the Ark is this dark, sinister um, force that is not something that you trifle with. Uh, and this is where I think Crystal Skull just went completely off the rails, where the skull was just treated as this this dumb prop that you could like throw around um, and not really worry about too much. And so, like, yeah, we'll get into that later, obviously. Um, but I, I think what uh, what indeed discovers is that he needs um yeah i'm trying to think how it how, how it leads there he basically needs a, a a piece of information from a friend um, of his named abner abner ravenwood uh, right uh ravenwood uh you know he was uh kind of an apprentice uh to abner ravenwood and he was and that's where he met you know his daughter i mean that's when brody said when he, when he asked brody do you think uh Marion will be with him, you know, when he's thinking packing and he says, Marion's the least of your problems, Indy. Uh, yeah. You know, he says, uh, you know, what you're going after, no one knows its secrets. It's like nothing you've ever gone after before. And, yeah. and Marcus, I'm not afraid of the boogeyman. Besides, you know what a cautious fellow I am. And he tosses his gun, gun onto yeah. his bag and then we just go, dun, 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 d
you know, classic, uh, you know, line going over the map and the shot of the old plane flying. Uh, yeah. This thing just just hurdles. And, and on the plane is the guy that ultimately will, uh, you know, is following him, you know, that that uh, Nazi guy in black. Uh, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing setup. It never gets boring. It, it just keeps hurtling. And, yeah. and that is in the best tradition of the, of the kind of Saturday serials that, uh, Lucas is, is emulating. But uh, it, to your point, critical drinker, which I actually hadn't considered this before. Well done, sir. Uh, about, uh, you know, the first movie is Judaism, the second movie is Hinduism, and the third is Christianity. I'd never looked at it that way. Yeah. But you say about how the whole movie has this foreboding about uh, the Lost Ark. Uh, every time that somebody is discussing the Lost Ark, even in the library, uh, you get uh, weird little, like, like you'll see like the chandeliers start just swaying out of nowhere. Uh, oh really? In the yeah, in the library, uh, when Marion has the the headpiece of the staff of Ron, she turns it. the The candle gets blown, and she just kind of looks at it. Uh, and uh, when uh, when Sala later on with uh, you know Indy and the old man, no, come here, come here, you know, take back to Kadam. Uh, yeah. and, and 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 when that happens, uh, there is also this power that is uh, moving things in the background. It's very subtle. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember the gust of wind, yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. <laughs> I think, the, you know, The Mummy with uh, with Brendan Fraser, um, that that movie played on that trope a little bit where, um, you know, the, at various times, like a sudden gust of wind will come through when they've, mm -hmm. they've discovered something sinister. I remember there's a bit around the campfire where one of the characters is like, maybe this place is cursed. And then there's a big gust of wind that blows up the ashes of the campfire. And yeah. Brendan Fraser just goes, ah, it happens a lot around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a good movie. It's a funny movie. Uh, <laughs> they did well uh, with that. But this thing, man, I, I wish that, you know, you could go like kind of frame by frame through it because the compositions are absolutely amazing. Uh, amazing dynamic like like a graphic novel you know yeah, I mean, well, they they love their shadows against the wall don't mm -hmm. they you oh know, when yeah a new, when a new person has arrived like you just the, the door opens the light spills in and their shadow is just silhouetted against the wall behind marion uh, and at first it's Indy, then it's it's uh arnold tote the the nazi like guy who's there to interrogate her yes uh, and I, what you know marion what a great character she is like what a great introduction she gets she's in a drinking contest like they're way up in the himalayas somewhere like she's just in this <laughs> bar at the ass end of nowhere that she runs um, and she's doing this drinking contest with this great big mountain of a dude um i just drinks him right under the table like i love how you know he he finishes his drink and you think he's won and then he just slowly topples <laughs> backwards he has a huge smile on his face yeah and then he just passes out <laughs> He died doing what he loved. <laughs> and, and uh, she is she is remarkable, and she is a rebuttal, a perfect rebuttal to all of these woke wankers that try to say that those of us who love these classic films uh, don't like strong women and say bullshit. I yeah. love Marion Ravenwood, and she saves Indy's life several times in this movie. Oh, she's great. Yeah, and it, there's a there's a real give and take with them. You know, mm -hmm. he he helps her. Out. Um, I, I know, again, it's jumping ahead, but I might forget it later. I just fucking love the scene on the boat where Indy's all beat up and, like, Marion, I think, is um, she's looking at herself in the mirror and it's all, like, misted up, so she decides to swing it round and it just cracks him right on the chin. <laughs> and you, you just hear Indy go, ah! <laughs> Yeah. And <laughs> it's beautiful. It is beautiful, and so is she uh, in that gown. In that gown, oh, my yeah. God. And when she's on the surface of that boat and the wind is blowing and it's just pressed against her body. Oh, you uh, see everything, oh, yeah. She is. Yeah, she manages to be a very strong character and yet also very feminine. And uh, I think that's a wonderful thing. Same as Ellen Ripley, same as uh, Linda Hamilton in, in the Terminator series. Uh, you know, we, we there are those of us who love women 
uh, in all of their uh, many, many shades of, of grace. And um, so, yeah, uh, Captain Marvel is quite different. Uh, a phony, basically a dude in, in, a, in a wig uh, is, is Captain Marvel. Uh, but, you know, if, if they'd have cast someone with, you know, femininity and, 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 and persona and, and, and charisma, uh, it would have been a much different movie than what it was with, with Brie Larson and Captain Marvel. Yeah, uh, very much. But I mean, I, I think uh, Marion's a great example of um, a character that, you know, she is fiery and, and uh, dangerous in her own right. You mm -hmm. obviously know that she can handle her drink, which, again, it's not just something that's shown to prove that she's tough. It's it's actually used later in the movie. It, it's actually a point of her character um, when she's trying to outdrink Belloc and she thinks she's got one over on him. But um <laughs> Yeah, I grew up on this stuff. It's my family yeah, yeah. label. Uh oh. Yeah, so basically, it comes from a line of alcoholics. So he's, he's <laughs> not going to get out drunk by anyone. Um, but yeah, like, but um, you know, she is fiery. She is. Um, she can be aggressive. She can fight when she has to. Um, but also, th those are things that she's had to become because of her circumstances. Like her dad, her father passed away. She was basically stranded in this country. She's trying to save up enough money to get the hell out of there. She's had to become tough. She didn't want to. Um, and when she gets the opportunities to wear, say, like uh, nicer clothes, um, she takes it, you know, and she, she likes that idea, you know, and she, she does have a feminine side to her. So you get to see both aspects of her character. And that's, that's just, you know, the kind of good writing that we were able to do, you know, 40 years ago, apparently. We can't do it now. Which is very sad. Uh, I, uh, writing is the heart and soul of any film. Uh, if yeah. you do not have a good script, I don't care how much cinematography and effects and actors you have, uh, it's just not going to play. It, you've got to have respect for the written word and for scripts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, in this scene, like I think Indy comes in, he wants uh, a, a medallion that, um, that Abner used to own. He's looking for it and he's willing to pay Marion money. You find out that um, when Abner had passed away, you know, no one came to help her out. She's been stuck here. She's pissed off at Indy because I think they had a bit of a relationship in the past. Um, and, you know, he, he's obviously never come to help her out. So she's basically like, yeah, get fucked, man. And so he leaves. Uh, and that's when the Nazis show up. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, uh, like, um, Ronald Lacey, I think, is the guy who plays this character, this Arnold Tote. Uh, and Tote means dead in German, by the way. It's just a, Oh, a nice. nice I didn't touch. know that. Um, yeah, like, he, he's not fucking around. Like, he wants the medallion. Uh, and I think he, he tries to bribe her initially, and then she's, like, not interested. So his men hold her down. And he's got the, the poker out the fire that's just glowing red hot. He's like, yeah, you're going to tell me now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, you know, Indy shows up to save the day. You know, he, he's got his bull whip. He whips the, the, the poker out of his hand and it sets the place on fire. You know, those big gunfights. Um, I, again, I love the bit where, um, you know, it's just mayhem. There's guys shooting at each other. Uh, the, 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 all the um, kind of barrels of wine up above the bar get hit and they start spraying wine out and Marion just goes underneath and like <laughs> puts her mouth in it. It's like, I need some Dutch courage for this shit. I know. And I love it when Indy, I mean, this film is so full of good humor and great jokes. Uh, you know, Indy's gotten the shit beat out of him by this giant, I don't know, German or Sherpa or something. Mm -hmm. And he, he's like leaning against the, the bar and getting pummeled. And he looks at Marion down there and says, whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she gives it to him, and he's doesn't drink it. He hits him with it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love the bit where uh, you know he's got one of the the guys like they're fighting and wrestling over a gun, and um, and Tote just goes shoots them, shoots them both. And so both of these guys turn like Indy and the other guy. Both are like fuck this and like shoot the guy dead. You know? <laughs> it's it is fantastic. It is <laughs> yeah. so much fun. And Marion saves him. Like like this guy is the drop on Indy. And then you hear this, and he looks down at his like gut, like, and, and then the guy starts bleeding from the mouth and drops, and you see Marion behind him, revealed, holding the gun, saved him, literally saved him. She does that twice, actually, because there's another mm -hmm. guy that's about to shoot him. She whacks him over the head with a log from the fire, 
Uh, I'm not. Uh, him yeah, out, so. yeah, yeah. And she does it again uh, when he's stealing the the German the flying wing. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, she's got like the guy is about to shoot Indy, and then she whacks him in the head with the wooden blocks. But unfortunately, yeah. those were the blocks keeping it from moving, so then it starts rolling. <laughs> yeah. It's there's always but there's always cause and effect, isn't there? That's yes, what, that's what's great. You know, uh, one thing always leads to another, and so these sequences always build off each other. Like again, in this one, um, the the medallion that Indy needs, it falls into a fire. You know, as the place is burning down, and so Tote tries to grab it. It burns his hand, uh, which just seems like a, a you know a funny moment in this because he has to run outside like ah and put it in in the snow to try and like you know cool it down. But that's like the the scar of that is then burned into his hand, and so the Nazis get the information that's imprinted onto this uh, medallion, you know. So that that's what leads them um, to the, where they need to go, and it gets them in the game as well. So again, it's all cause and effect. Um, but yeah, like Indy, or I think it's Marion who's able to grab the thing and actually take it outside, and and says to to Indy like, "I'm your goddamn partner," you know, and she holds it up. Yes. Uh, and then dun, 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 yeah, so dun, dun. they go again. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, just endless, man. Uh, Marion, oh, and I got, I can't let it go by without saying, uh, you know, when, when uh, they're in the bar earlier before all of this, and he says, you know where it is, you know where I can find it. She says, come back tomorrow. He says, why? She says, because I said so. That's why. And he turns away, and and he's going out the door, and she says. <laughs> See you tomorrow, Indiana Jones. And he turns, and you see his eye through the uh, cutout pattern of the of the door. You see the light uh, on his eye. I mean, it's just so graphic. It's so brilliant. The, uh, just a little touch like that. It's a visual thing, and it's hard to describe. But everyone who's seen it will remember that moment. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the scene composition in so many of these these little bits is just great. You know, yeah. it's it's. I love how it's put together, and so um, I think they they then head off to uh, Cairo, which is where they're going to be digging up um, the Ark. Um, right. No, sorry. Wait, uh, is it Tanis? I think that's the name of the city. Uh, uh, yeah, that to... that's what I I, I yeah. Uh, what happened was that uh, you know uh, you know when the G men are there. Uh, you know, and, and talk about, uh, we received, we intercepted this telegram, Tannis excavation proceeding, contact Abner Ravenwood, skull uh, headpiece staff of Raw. And, and Indy turns to Marcus and says, the Nazis have discovered Tannis. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because that Ravenwood had done the serious work at Tannis. So they know exactly where it is. And they know from that cable, uh, where the uh, where where the uh, where they're gonna go and investigate where the ark probably is, but Indy knows the headpiece of the staff of Ra uh, is something that Abner had, and so that's why he goes to uh, Tibet first to to see if he can get it from Marion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I so I think that's when he meets up with uh, Salah because that's his contact uh, mm -hmm. in the area, um, and and Marion's there as well, and I think that's. Um, Again, you get another warning from Salah about um, about the Ark. You know, again, saying like death has always surrounded it. Um, it's not of this world. And again, it's just another one of those sinister moments where where you just it starts to build up the danger and the menace around this thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like uh, the Maltese Falcon, you know, where you keep yeah. hearing about the Black Bird. Uh, you know, and everyone's chasing the Black Bird until finally in Act Three we get to see. The actual Maltese Falcon. And yeah, then, uh, you know it's <laughs> it's an amazing thing, you know. And at the end of the movie, you know the the cop picks it up after everyone's been arrested and says, "Hmm, heavy. What is it?" And Humphrey Bogart says, "The uh, stuff that dreams are made of." Yeah. God, that's great. Classic God, that's a great movie. Oh man. I uh, yeah. I we're we're reveling in alcohol and and love of cinema. And and what, what better what better life are we living than this? Not bad, not bad at all. Um and you know, I think this is leads into like there's another big shootout with the with the Nazis there um because they get discovered um and uh it, it's great because you know, this whole fight sequence like it, again, it's all done with practical effects. It's all just stunt men and stuff. Um, and I love the bit where, like, it's that classic scene where the swordsman appears 
uh, and he's doing his sword twirling thing and you think oh shit this is going to be a hell of a fight and then he just pulls out his gun and shoots him um <laughs> And that was that was actually that wasn't that wasn't what their original plan was, but apparently the whole crew were stricken with uh, with diarrhea uh, because they were shooting on location, and you know the water was tainted, and they were all fucked up. Uh, and Harrison Ford could barely stand up at that point, and they were like, "God damn, we're supposed to have this big, uh, intense fight scene where you're going to be taking on this swordsman," and and Ford just goes, "Why don't I just shoot the fucker?" And, <laughs> And Spielberg just went, you know what? Fucking bang on, mate. Let's just do that. <laughs> yeah. And that's how you got that scene. <laughs> and it was much better than than the, any kind of fight laughter that it got because it, you know, it set up the expectations. And and John Williams scores going bum, 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 da, 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 as he's twirling his sword. And, and that's yeah. it. Uh, and there, I, I actually are storyboards of that uh, sequence. Uh, that I've seen. So, I mean, they really were going to shoot it. They had storyboarded it out. And uh, yeah. it, it's a, it's one of these great moments of uh, verisimilitude where, you know, uh, shit, let's just, let's just do it. It's, it's well, wonderful. I, I think, and again, it's a perfect example. Like, you know, because how many movies are, are you watching where you, you think, God damn, a gun would just like resolve this in about two seconds. It actually just has the balls to do it. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter how good your sword fighting skills are. I've got a gun. I can just shoot you. you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, oh, my God. And it was also funny in that whole sequence when, uh, uh, you know, this guy is chasing Mary and then she pulls a frying pan from a vendor and she's wielding it like a bat. And then he goes, ah, 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 and he pulls out a knife and she says, uh, uh, bye bye and runs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because she hides in a basket and then they carry it off and like they put it in a truck. Uh, and then the truck ends up getting blown up, you know. Uh, so Indy thinks that Marion's been killed in all this, uh, you know, this this gunfight. Um, not knowing that she's she's just been captured by the Germans, you know. Um, right. And that leads to a great, great scene uh, with Indy and uh, Belloc. Uh, you know, Indy is sitting there and the music, Marion's theme is playing and he's sitting there with a drink and the monkey uh, that she had liked, you know, on his shoulder. Little traitor, double agent monkey, but never the mind. Uh, yeah. and, and it's Cummins, mit, Dr. Jones, Cummins, mit, mit on, sir, whatever he says. And he, he just kind of tags along and then there's Belloc. Dr. Jones? Yes. Belloc, I had to kill you right now. Not a very private place for a murder. Please sit down before you fall down. We can yeah. at least act like civilized men. Uh, it's, it, it's a great thing. And, and, and in that scene, Drinker, uh, Belloc also uh, discusses about, about the Ark. Uh, he says, uh, Jones, do you realize what the Ark is? It's a radio. It's a transmitter for speaking to God, and it's within my reach. Yeah. And Jones looks at me and says, you want to talk to God? Let's go see him together. I got nothing better to do. Yeah, I love how just there's no fucks given from Indy there. He's just in full-on, like, I'm ready to die yeah. mode. Um, yeah. It shows how, like, how close he was to Mary and how much he cared for her, that her death has upset him that much. Um, but, yeah, I, again, it's a great insight into Belloc as a character as well because – you know, he's working with the Nazis, but he doesn't really care about their cause. He's not interested in them. Um, he, they're just a means to an end for him. He wants the Ark because he really believes in what it actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that, I think that's interesting. You know, it sets them up as, you know, he's working with the enemy, but he's not necessarily one of them. Yeah, um, Belloc says in that conversation, we are, we are not so different, you and I. Yeah, I am just a shadowy reflection of you. It would only take a nudge to shove you out of the light. And he says, now you're talking nasty. And, and yeah. you know, that entire scene damn near is, is in one shot. I mean, they, they yeah. have Indy in the extreme foreground in profile, and they have Belloc uh, lit better in the back. Uh, and I, I really like Belloc. I mean, I, I find him a fascinating character. I genuinely uh, am interested in him. And he's not just a one-dimensional, you know, like the, the, the damn Nazis. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's a nuanced character. Yeah. I, he, he's willing to die as well for what he believes in. Like, there's a point later on where, you know, India's got like a rocket launcher. He's ready to blow the Ark to pieces. And, and Belloc 
actually takes a gun out and and forces the soldiers around it to to back away. And he says to Indy, "You're right. If you're if that's what you want to do, blow it up. Go for it. I'm not going to stop you." But I know you're not going to do it because I know you want to see it opened as well. You want to know what's inside this thing just as much as I do. He's willing to gamble his life and everything on that moment, uh, and that's that's pretty cool as as a character. It's it's an amazing character, and uh, when we get back to the uh, ending, it uh, has a lot to say about uh, narrative strategies and why that that ending works so well. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but I love him, and and in that scene. I don't know if you remember this, but Paul Freeman, uh, who plays Belloc, his concentration is so great. Uh, a fly like lands on his face <laughs> yeah. and actually seems to like walk <laughs> into his mouth or something, and he doesn't even flinch. Yeah, I, I remember that. That that became a total meme for for many a year. <laughs> what Belloc the hell? just doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> it's just like do the scene, eat the fly. It's added protein. I don't care. We eat snails. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. Um, I, I, it's just a flawless flaw. I can't find anything in this movie that I would change. Not one line, not one shot, nothing. Yeah, it's it's um, it's it's a very efficient movie, and you know it's obviously got a ton of action sequences and stuff, but they they never they never feel tiresome. Like each one just feels different from the last. They're, they're all unique. They all feel like they they add to the story. Um, and yeah, they, they never overwhelm it. The, the movie knows when to back off and to to give you a bit more character development, a bit more plot progression. Um, everything's just nicely paced. Um, I, I love the whole sequence where they, um, you know, Indy is able to sneak into the map room. Like the whole point is that they've got the medallion, um, and as much as the the Germans have got one side of the medallion because it's scarred into to Tote's hand. There's a, an inscription on the other side that says that you have to take back some of the, the height of the staff that you're going to mount this thing on um, to honor the, the Hebrew god that, the, that created the Ark. Uh, but the Germans don't know that, so they're basically digging in the wrong place. And so <laughs> Indy's able to go into the map room with the correct staff. You put it into like a hole in the ground. The sun comes in, and it's just this big epic scene. Again, ultimately all he's doing is just reading off a map. But it's mm -hmm. done in this big, epic, extravagant way where you feel the significance of what's going on. Um, and it just makes every moment of this film, this every step towards finding the Ark just feels like this big biblical event, you know, set in like the present day. It's such a great like building up of tension and drama, you know. And so they know where to dig then. There's like a, a big model of the old city there. And even when you see the guys digging for the temple where the ark stored, that there's lightning and thunder and stuff in the sky behind them. They're like silhouetted against this big storm. Again, you feel the the significance of what they're doing here. It's great. I love how it builds this stuff up. I know, and the level of detail uh, and integrity in the in the script and in the filmmaking is fantastic. Because when Indy gets down there, and he's got you know his notebook and he's sweating, he's got his little pencil, and he, he comes to. Uh, there's a row of holes uh, for the staff to go in, and there's one that's open, and and the rest are covered in dirt. And he goes back three holes, and then blows it clean, and that's where he puts the staff. Yeah, and that makes all the difference. It's just so damn brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah. And so that even the moment where they find it, like it's Indy and Salah that go down into the the pit. There's and there's snakes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the snakes. You know why not? Um, I, I know, and and that's the perfect capper. Uh, we we didn't even talk about that, but that's the perfect capper to the opening of the film because you know he uh, you know he he runs from the Hovitos. They're throwing spears at him. He's ch he's hauling ass uh, over the the field, and, and and dirt and webs are flying off him like, <laughs> and he's yeah. Jack. Start up the plane, and, and you know they're they're blowing darts at him. He swings into the water and swims, and and gets on the bu on the plane. And then huh, there's a big snake in the plane, Jock. Oh, that's just my <laughs> snake, pet snake, Reggie. I hate snakes, snakes, Jock. I hate them. Oh, come on, show a little backbone, will you? And then they fly off. I mean, that's perfect. Yeah, ah, oh, so good fun. It's so good. And then it um, sets it up because this is a fear of Indies. Uh, which is so beautifully explained in Last Crusade, but we'll get to that. 
Yeah. Uh, beautiful opening sequence. But anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's 50 million snakes down there. And uh, it's it's really incredible. But I want to go back real quick uh, to when India is in the map room. Yes. The way that they uh, have, uh, they sustain suspense through what would otherwise be kind of an expositionary scene is Sala gets, remember, he gets busted by the, the Nazis. And what are you doing? And and he says, oh, oh you know, and, and, and he, you know, he, he pulls up the the rope and everything and and uh and he's got to go and find something else so he's going around and gathering up bits of cloth and everything and then when it's time for indy finally to go remember he drops down this uh knotted uh bunch of cloth and shit and then one of them is the damn flag (laughs) yeah yeah he's had to like steal them from over in the camp you know (laughs) i mean that was just a little extra thing to generate more suspense uh, in what would others always be okay? And he's taking measurements. And he's, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's so it's so cleverly constructed, flawlessly constructed. Yeah. Well, here's a good comment. I saw, I saw this. I quite liked it. Someone asked how old you are. I said sixty five. Does that work? I'm actually eighteen years old. This is what drink and living in Scotland does to you. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, uh, but he's he's uh yeah he's he's kind of preserved in peat. Uh, because of the Isla varieties of scotch that uh, yeah. he drinks, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, <laughs> great preservative. Going. Yeah, I'm pickled. Um, yeah, so um, you, you find out as well that Marion's alive. She's been kept prisoner by the Nazis, and that's when you get that scene with her and Belloc, who wants her. He wants her to wear a dress, like a, he's got this lovely frilly dress thing for her to wear. Oh yeah, um, and you know she's like, yeah, oh, fine, I'll put it on. Um, and you know, you, you just see him looking at her like just in the mirror, kind of thing. Because yeah, she takes her top off, and you get to see her topless for a second. And you just you don't quite see everything, but you see enough. Um, and she's like, "Yeah, fuck off! Don't look at me." But <laughs> he he's poured her a drink, and again, it ties back into when she, you first met her that you know that she can drink more than most people. And so you think her plan is basically to get him pissed and then just escape while he's while he's passed out. And so you see them getting more and more drunk together. She's pretending and she grabs like a knife and she's like backing away like she's going to escape. And he starts laughing. Um, and then she's just like, yeah, this is... <laughs> um, no, sorry, Belloc says, like, I, I brewed this stuff myself. It's from my family's vineyard. And so you realize he's not nowhere near as drunk as he appears to be. Right. He's just putting on the act. They were both fooling each other, um, and I think that's when the 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 um, Arnold tote shows up. Um, and I love like that bit where he brings out like a coat hanger, but it's like it's like a nunchuck or something. Yeah, and and they're all cringing. Like, ah, like, <laughs> slowly puts it together and then just hangs his coat on it. Like I think, you think it's going to be this really torturous scene, but like he just hangs his leather jack on it. It's so <laughs> it's great. funny. So much. You know, Drinker, I've never thought of this uh, this adjective in, uh, in terms of this movie before, but honestly, the action scenes uh, are, are witty. They're, they're just witty. Uh, yeah. There's so much wit, uh, cleverness, little jokes happening within uh, even the most... Uh, uh, aggressive action scene uh you know like like in the truck scene you know when when they're you know the two guys are struggling for the for the wheel of the of the truck and they you know uh kind of kind of narrowly avoid crashing into the walls and, and they get splashed with water from the viaduct and stuff and and then you know they come out in the clear and and indy smiles and looks at him and he laughs and looks at him and then indy punches him out of the out of the car <laughs> yeah. uh, just just so many little moments like that i i love it when when marion is backing away with the knife and says <laughs> i must be going renee i really like you renee perhaps someday we'll meet under better circumstances and she turns and there is there's tote and he says you americans always overdressing for the wrong yeah patients. What a great line. I know it. And then after he hangs the the, the coat hanger, he goes, Now, what shall we talk about? <laughs> yeah. He's so sleazy, that guy. Like that actor <laughs> just plays him great. Um and yeah, like I love how the you know, once Indy and, and Salav managed to get the arc out, again, it's like this big epic scene where they lift it out of the the mm-hmm. um 
sarcophagus that it's in. That's when Billock shows up with the Nazis and, you know, they, they throw Marion into the pit with him. Um, and, you know, he, he's... Uh, I think Belloc gives them a great line. It's like, yeah, perhaps, Mr. Jones, in a thousand years, even you will be worth something. <laughs> and Harrison and I, Ford's reaction is just priceless. He goes, ha, 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 son, of a, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, great. So pulp, man. So evocative of, of things like the spirit. I don't know if you ever read the spirit uh, comics uh, way back when, uh, you know, uh, uh, Will Eisner, uh, uh, great, great uh, forebearer of, uh, uh, you know, graphic uh, storytelling, sequential storytelling uh, back in right. the... 40s it was a newspaper thing uh and and you know they would have shit like that in it they wouldn't say so but you you know see the character with the symbols you know cussing hmm. uh it felt like that it, it's just so great man yeah one of my uh, favorite moments but see that's the thing throughout the movie there's oh this is a favorite moment this is a favorite moment this is a favorite moment this is, you can't catalog them all so many yeah and it, it, it's why movies like this are just such a joy to watch because like every every couple of minutes there's just another bit where you think oh, I remember that that's so well done um, and you, yeah you're just sitting there like yeah I just I, I love what they did there <laughs> you know yeah uh, you know there's another big action sequence where. You know, Indy has to push over one of the big pillars that collapses down and, and breaks open a wall so they can escape. Um, and you get that great fight scene where the, the, the arc is going to be loaded onto a flying wing, which, again, just a brilliant uh, sequence. Like, this this thing, this plane never actually existed in real life. And apparently it was originally going to be much bigger. Um, mm -hmm. It was going to have, like, three engines on each side. It was going to be huge. And they were running short on budget. They're like, how the fuck can we, we cut this down a little bit? And apparently Spielberg just took the model and snapped off the, the, the wings so that there was only like one engine on each side. And he's like, there you go. It saved you like $20 million or whatever. And so they, they just went with that. Um, <laughs> and it looks great. I mean, you know. It's it cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a cool, unique looking aircraft. Um, and again, you can understand what's going on at all times during this. You know, they... they Indy goes in, um, he ends up fighting with the, the big giant mechanic guy. Um, Marion knocks out the pilot and he falls onto the throttle controls so the plane starts to move around. And because they've taken, she's used the, the wooden chocks to like knock someone out, the plane starts just kind of going in a circle and it hits like a gas canister, you know, a fuel bowser or whatever it is that starts then leaking fuel. So again, you've got a ticking time bomb situation where it's leaking uh, towards like you know some fire that's like been started because she's been on the machine guns on this plane it's all just stuff that builds up perfectly together so you understand what's happening you understand how it's constructed and you understand the danger these characters are in and it is classical direction and editing something that is sadly lacking in most films these days because you know these days a uh, director average just kind of gets a bunch of fucking coverage and uh and throws it in uh you know cuisinart of a you know non-linear editor and just lets a lets an editor just kind of slap dash this shit together but spielberg directed like hitchcock directed uh psycho for example uh the famous shower sequence in psycho uh is is meticulously uh storyboarded and uh and it consists of i think like a hundred uh plus shots in about 60 seconds uh and uh it's just absolutely flawless meticulous like a comic book artist would lay out a comic book if he was good and it's similar here uh that you always get a sense of the spatial relationships you always get a sense of where everything is what's happening there is no confusion and uh when we get to the truck sequence there's no greater, I don't think, uh, example of cinematic history of a better designed sequence, uh, which has so many different characters, so many different moving elements, and yet you never get confused. It's it's just incredible. No, I, I, I love it. Um, there was just a point here that someone brought up, and I, I was going to address it. Yeah, the big German mechanic is the same actor as the giant Nepalese dude in the bar at the beginning. Uh, yes, he is. His name is Pat Roach, um, and I think he's in all of the indie movies because 
he, he plays uh, in Temple of Doom. There's like a big um, burly swordsman guy that Indy fights who ends up getting pulled into like a giant like grinder machine. Like it's just a big wheel. It catches his turban and starts to pull him in. Oh yeah, right. Uh, yeah, th- this was like th- this dude was like a really well known stuntman who who was in a ton of movies. But yeah, he he always played a different role in every indie movie. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that that death of the mechanic, like when the propeller just like he turns around and the propeller's right there, and just see him go ah, and then there's just like blood sprays all over the canopy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that guy was magnificent. He that was, was great. Magnificent. Yeah. You got well, a love how spin. In- well, I love how Indy like hits him several times and barely staggers him, and th- this guy just hits some Indy once. And he pauses for a moment and then just drops right on his ass, like <laughs> he's almost out of the fight with one punch. I know it, it, it goes to the to show you Harrison Ford is a great physical actor. Uh, I mean, there is so much you, you talked about it, but there's no way to describe the nuance of you know, Indy uh, tries to punch him once, tries to punch him again. Uh, the guy hits him once, and his leg kind of wobbles a little bit, yeah. and then he falls back. <laughs> <laughs> and you get a sense, uh-oh. And the German is enjoying it. I mean, this guy is not interested in actually like crushing Indy. He just wants to slowly uh, pound on him. So he's well, like, come he's, on, he's get, up, get up. Yeah, yeah. It's like old school fisticuffs. He's like, ah, come on, come and see here. Come on. Yeah. yeah. He <laughs> loves it. That guy was a great, uh, great actor. Uh, I mean, I, you know, stuntman, whatever. Uh, he was perfect in that part. When he comes out, he sees what's going on and he takes off his jacket and takes off his cap with this relish. Yes, right. <laughs> ah, fighting is to be done. I see. <laughs> Pat Roach, yeah. that's his name. Yeah, that's that's his name. Yeah, he's been like I say, he's been in a ton of movies, but um, yeah, Fantastic. I think he was well known for doing like stunt work in the indie films. And yeah, he plays a different character basically every time. Um, but yeah, like like you say, it leads into the truck sequence um, where the Ark has been loaded aboard uh, a truck, and Indy's got to try and catch up to it, and. It's it's just great because like he you know he he gets into the back where like all the German troopers are um, you know fights a bunch of them uh, he ends up getting like you know thrown over the front of the truck and he like falls right underneath it uh, and he's he's like getting dragged along by the whip like the whole sequence is just great he even gets fucked up when he get when he kicks his way into the cab and he gets shot right in the arm oh, and man. the guy starts pounding on his arm you know like and getting blood on his fist i mean very visceral and uh, from what i understand uh now this may be i can't imagine this is true but this is what i heard is that uh, a second unit actually shot the the entire truck sequence uh with very meticulous uh storyboards from uh from steven spielberg and and his people and uh one of the things that that was so wise that spielberg said is that even when we're in the truck you have to see through you know a reflection in the you know outside the window or in the you know the rear view mirror or the side mirrors that motion is happening you've always got to see uh, that motion is happening. So no matter what angle you pick, we got to have it wide enough where we see the outside. And that was uh, just a brilliant uh, a note. You, you keep that visceral thing going and you keep track of all the people. Like, you know, when, when there's all the people in the back and, you know, each one is getting kind of dispatched and then you've got the commander finally that says, Shaisa. And, and he, you know, he says, okay, I'm going to have to go take care of this myself. And he's, he's crawling along the top and you hear that rum, 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 ba da da da. Yeah. And then his hat flies off, and he looks back at it and says, "Ah, oh, fuck it," you know. <laughs> they go on. <laughs> then he swings in there, and he's kicking in his ass. He's the one that is uh, punching him in the in the bloody arm, and then he throws his ass out uh, the front windshield. Yeah, well, Indy's hanging off the the front of the car, and he's like trying to he's trying to hold onto it, but like all the bars of the radiator are just bending as he's trying to like pull himself up. And like the guy's gonna ram him right into the car in front, and that's when Indy allows himself to drop down underneath and like slide at the back again. All just done through stunt work, yeah. stunt work and practical effects. There was no CGI for this, and goddamn, that's just it's glorious to watch. It is all practical stuff. Like for example, uh, in uh, the earlier basket chase, when uh, the truck 
there's an explosion and the truck turns on its side and 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 then uh goes in a little bit of a circle and then and then finally blows up uh you can see uh if you if you look very carefully through the smoke there's a big pipe sticking out of the bottom of the truck that they use to blow it uh, up on its side for uh, that spot okay. and uh, when indy goes under the truck in this there's a ditch that actually a shallow ditch that is dug to give enough clearance to the stunt man to actually go safely under the truck. I like that. I like that. I mean, it's, you know, obviously you, you get a little glimpse to how the stunt was done, but then you just recognize like, yeah, they had to put a lot of thought and work into actually doing that. Uh, yeah. It doesn't you know, impact my enjoyment of the film at all. Cause you can't really, you can't really see the ditch. I mean, but I know it's there, but it's, it's brilliantly done. Yeah. Yeah, I love it, and um, you know the. I I think all of this leads to like the Indies managed to get the truck, and so they load it on board a ship um, that's going to like get them back to America, but it gets intercepted by a U boat along the way, and they're forced to hand over um, the Ark. And I love the, you know, again it builds up the menace of the Ark, like it's uh, it's inside this wooden crate with the swastika <laughs> emblazoned on it, and you just hear this like weird pulsing sound coming from it, and like the the rats in the ship's hold all start dying, um, and the 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 swastika just gets uh, burned out, basically, like the the whole thing just kind of blackens as you go, and just what a cool effect! Like they totally did not need to do that. But it just again shows you this is a thing you do not fuck with, um, and I just yeah I love it. I it love was the power there. of God burning the loathsome yeah. Nazi symbol off of the the face of the crate. It's amazing. Which is funny because it's actually like the Nazi symbol, like the swastika, is actually a Hindu symbol for like peace and prosperity. So it's like... it, it, it is, but it's uh, it's rotated uh, forty five degrees. That's ah, the difference. Right, yeah. uh, the the yeah. Hindu symbol is straight up. And uh, and of course that is an ancient symbol that was corrupted uh, by the the Germans. Yes. Uh, so when it's tilted, that's when it's a, a damn Yahtzee uh, uh, symbol. But um, yeah, isn't that funny? And then of course we get Hinduism in Temple of Doom. But we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, and so the um, I'm trying to think how they do this, they um, are forced to hand over Marion and the Ark. I don't know why the Germans want Marion. I think it's like uh, Belloc that wants her or something. Right. He he says, uh, if she does not please me, uh, you can do as as you will. I will I will have no more patience with her. Yeah, it's a dog. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> I, but then like everyone's looking for Indy because no one knows where he is, and then they they see him and he's on top of the 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 U boat. Uh, he's like on the Conan Tower, and so he's just like riding it all the way to their their hidden base where they're taking the Ark. And I just love the fact that this U boat, this submarine, never actually bothers to go underwater the whole time. It, he, yeah, Indy would be proper fucked if that had happened. <laughs> well, if he had attached his uh, his whip to the periscope and they were very shallow, he might have just rode the whole way with his head just above the waves. But it's a it is a the only the closest thing to a plot hole. I think that there is in, in Raiders, but what if the uh, the Nazi island is uh, pretty close by, and so they just don't yeah. bother to to submerge? I mean, I know that like U boats, like if they go underwater, then they have to run off batteries, uh, mm -hmm. and so they probably wouldn't want to do that unless they needed to. And because this is before the war actually started, it's not actually wartime, right? They, yeah, it's probably reasonable that they would just cruise on the surface with their diesel engines running. So. Yeah, I can buy into that. It's fine. It doesn't. It doesn't um, seem illogical or anything. Um, and yeah, like you know, they get to the the sub base, um, and Indy, he cut, he gets off the boat and like he knocks out a guard, and you just see him trying to put the guy's shirt on, and like the guy must have been tiny because Harrison Ford can't get it buttoned. <laughs> <laughs> just more great humor and you can tell he watches with with blazing eyes as marion and and Belloc get off the the u-boat and uh, it's quite clear from their chilly uh treatment towards each other that marion did not succumb and give Belloc what he wanted so now he is done with her uh, yeah. she is no longer under his protection yeah uh and so indy you know, they, he makes his way, because um, they're basically taking the Ark to like a temple or, or somewhere where they can open it. Um, and so Indy like confronts them with a with a grenade launcher. 
It looks like a, um, a Sturmgeschutz, which I don't think was developed until like 10 years later. Like it was definitely a, like a, a later war thing, but like he's got one basically. So yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to dwell too much on it. Um, Sorry, no, it's not a Sturmgeschütz, it's a Panzerfaust. Sorry, I'm getting my things mixed up. A Sturmgeschütz is a, is a fucking assault tank. Uh, but yeah, a Panzerfaust is what it looks like. Uh, but that wasn't developed until like the 1940s easily. Um, but anyway, yeah, he's going he's gonna to blow up the Ark, and that's when Belloc eats a fly and challenges him to blow it up. Um, <laughs> and he's like, nah, I guess not then. And so they take him prisoner. And this is where the movie culminates. And... Um, you know, Indy and Marion have been taken prisoners, so they can't do anything. They just have to watch as this thing gets opened. Um, and I remember I watched this as a kid. Like, the very first time I saw it, I was, like, seven, six or seven years old. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they open this thing, and it's just filled with sand. Like, I, I guess the it's, it's meant to contain, isn't it, the Ark of the Covenant. It's meant to contain the sandstone tablets that Moses brought down from, from the mountain with yes. the, the Ten Commandments on it. Yes, and it's almost like I don't know the, the, the they've crumbled away into dust or sand over, over time. The yes. millennia. Uh, they're holding it up, and you know, I, again, I think it's a cool like effect because you, you you've wanted to know all this time what the hell's inside this thing, and then when he opens it up, it's just filled with sand, and he's holding it in his hands, and just like it's fallen through his fingertips, and I think Tote walks away laughing. You know, like what a joke this whole thing was. It was all for nothing, right? And that's when you get all this, these these weird spirit things that start to rise up out the ground around them and start to like um, encircle them, um, and you know they they think it's they think it's some great thing that's happening, and it, they suddenly like they turn into like skeletons and like demons and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and just blow <laughs> blow through them, and um, this is a very interesting uh, point, and I, I'd like to. Uh, raise it with you and, and get your opinion as a as a writer. Uh, yeah, I'm, we're both writers. Um, I I I I find this fascinating because the ending really shouldn't work as well as it does because despite all the spectacle, Indy and Marion are bound and and helpless and and basically spectators uh, to what is essentially a Deus ex machina kind of ending where God comes down and uh, sets everything right, takes care of the Nazis, and, and frees them. Mm. And so that's that's like one of the oldest tricks in the book, and it, it's kind of a hoary trick. But in my opinion, the reason that this, that this works so well is that the actual climax of the movie is at the Ark of the Covenant where Indy says, I'm going to blow up the Ark, Renee! And, and, and Belloc looks at him and he says, go ahead, blow it up. Yes, blow it back to God. Uh, you know, uh, you want to see this open as well as I, I do. He says, Indiana Jones, we are merely passing through history. This, this is history. Mm. Do as you will. So he just wanted to get married. And he said, I just want to get married. It seems how, how reasonable we're going to be. All I want is the, is the girl. And he just shakes his head. And if, and if, and if we refuse, then your Fuhrer has no prize. But, in the end, this is actually the climax of the film because all through the film, the tension has been, is Indiana Jones uh, genuinely passionate about archaeology or is he a treasure hunter like, like Belloc? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what really matters to Indiana Jones? And even more than his own life, even more than Marion's life, uh, he values history for its own its own purposes. And, and this is a a emotional climax to Indiana Jones story. What happens after that doesn't really matter. I mean, other than his physical safety, but that tells us everything we need to know. It resolves the character's uh, conflict. And that's why it's so emotionally satisfying. It doesn't matter at the end of the movie. Yeah. I, I think um, this is the core of Indiana Jones. He's a, he's a, explorer he's a well he's an archaeologist and he's fascinated by by revealing the truth and discovering history and again this is something that you get in last crusade as well where he's willing to die to get his hands on the the holy grail you know i love that scene where he's like elsa has fallen into this pit like trying to get the this grail that's like hanging on a ledge and indy then finds himself in the same situation he's desperately reaching for it because 
this is a thing. This is part of history, like one of the greatest historical treasures you could imagine. And he wants to share it with the world. He wants to bring it back to humanity. Um, but he like doing it would cost his life. And that's when his father has to say to him in, you know, Indiana, let it go. And he has to, he has to give that up in order to, to survive. Uh, but that's the core of his character is that he, he wants to return these things to humanity. I guess these things that have been buried for thousands of years, um, he is ultimately an archaeologist. He's not a treasure hunter. He's not in it for personal glory. Mm -hmm. He's in it for, for revealing these things for what they are. Um, and uh, yeah, you get that here. He wasn't willing to destroy the Ark because he wanted to see it open yeah. as much as anyone else. And he didn't so want Bella to destroy was, such a, a precious uh, thing, a, a precious piece of human history, I think. Yeah, so uh, Belloc was right about him. He was yeah. absolutely right about Indy's motivations. Um and you know, as much as he cares for Marion, he clearly does. He also he he I don't know. He's consumed by this desire to 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 get to the truth and and see what this thing really is. Um, and yeah, I I'm fine with the fact that the the, the end doesn't have to be resolved with a, another fist fight. We've had yeah you know dozens of them throughout the film. We've we've had all that we need. Um, this just comes down to an act of faith, I suppose, on Indy's part. Um, and he recognizes that they can't do anything more now. All they can do, I think, is just close their eyes, not look at what's happening, um, and just hope that they'll be spared. And ultimately, they are. Um, it does make me wonder, like, if they kept their eyes open, even though they're they're good people, would they have just been killed along with the, the Nazis yeah, as well? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think they would have. I think they would have for sure. Uh, you know, because you can't look at the you know face of God or or whatever and and live and so that's kind of like the you know the nod to uh not making it deus ex machina that that indy uh you know uses his lore and his uh his faith to say marion don't look at it keep your eyes shut no matter what happens and that's i think what's what spares them but i don't yeah. think that's quite enough it's too passive i think i think the scene before uh, elevates Raiders of the Lost Ark from a simple, you know, mindless adventure to uh to a drama uh, to some extent. I mean, it really has in depth characters, reveals character through action, and uh, that that is a just an incredibly satisfying emotional climax to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, um, I also want to say just that yeah that that scene where you see their faces melt um, and. I think uh, one of their heads explodes and the other one just like withers away. Like that freaked the shit out of me as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that running out of the fucking living room when that bit happened. Like, when, you know, uh, Tote just goes like, ah, and his face just fucking melts right oh, off. Oh, <laughs> man, his eyeballs turn wide. I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah. It's, it's clearly just like they made him out of fucking ice or something and they just, just sped it up. But like, you didn't notice that when you were a kid. It was just like properly horrifying. Um, yes. and yeah, it, it has just again just a great um, final scene where where Indy wants to know what the hell's happened to this arc, and he's told like you know it's been studied by top men, like who exactly top men, and then it's just yeah, I just see it getting put away in this giant like uh, warehouse, like, never to be seen again, you know. <laughs> it was spent, and there's like how many other secrets are in there. And I really love Marion, like, you know, taking his arm and uh, at the end and, you know, they don't know what they've got there. Well, I know what I've got here. Uh, should we have a drink? Mm -hmm. Drink? And just kind of yeah. cheers him up. And, you know, it, it's it's such a, a nice touch between those two. Yeah. I love it. Um, Marion is a great character. Obviously, Indy's a fantastic character. Um, yeah, I just, I think they got the perfect pair in there. I think the actors, like, you know, Karen Allen's just perfect in this role. Um, yeah, they, they did a great job. And it, it kind of leads us on to, wow, the the interesting movie of the trilogy um, <laughs> where you get Temple of Doom, where instead of doing a sequel, they, they did a prequel with this. It's set like before the events of, um, of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And man, you know, Temple of Doom is a funny one for me. Like I... I I sort of get why people like it. Um, and I know there's a lot of people who consider it their favorite of the trilogy. For me, there's just something a bit weird and a bit off kilter about the whole thing. 
Um, it, it feels odd. Indy's a bit different. You know, he doesn't quite feel like Indiana Jones. Uh, it's really dark. Like it's it's you know, even compared to the first one, you've got pe- you've got human sacrifices, like people getting their hearts ripped out and stuff. Like it's damn. Like you know, Spielberg really took this one to the next level. Um, yeah, like what's your thoughts on Temple of Doom? I've thought about it an awful lot. I've tried to to square it. Uh, I think the Temple of Doom is not an Indiana Jones movie. It's just not an Indiana Jones movie. Uh, now, I love uh, old, uh, you know, uh, pulp fiction, like literally pulp fiction, like, uh, you know, Doc Savage and The Shadow, uh, you know, those kinds of, of ancient pulp characters. And I, the way that I look at this movie and the way that I've found to enjoy it is that this is a, kind of a generic pulp hero that is not Indiana Jones. Uh, you know, I can look at it as just like, okay, this is like a Doc Savage kind of a, a character. He's named Indiana Jones, looks a little like him, but doesn't behave anything like him at all. And uh, it makes no sense as a prequel whatsoever to Raiders because, again, like I said, uh, you know, uh, I'm, you know, I don't believe in a lot of superstitious mumbo jumbo. He says in Raiders, and yet, shit, he's seen the <laughs> Shankara stones and seen all this supernatural shit. Seen a guy get his heart ripped out and it's still beating. Come on, man. Yeah, that 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 was a really weird choice. You could have just made a sequel. It wouldn't have made any difference. Like it wouldn't have changed Indy's character or anything. Um, yeah, like I, I think you said it already. <clears throat> The other thing, the other issue with Temple of Doom is the pacing. Like it just, it's particularly in the, the the final third, it just never stops. Like there's never a quieter scene like you get in Raiders, where it knows when to back off a little bit, give you a character moment, let you breathe a little bit. It's just constant action, constant fighting, um, and it just gets kind of tiring after a while. Yeah. You know, some of the, the some of the set pieces are fantastic. Like the minecart chase is incredible to watch. Um, but again, it's just it never lets up, and I think when a movie does that and it never gives you a chance to breathe, you get eventually kind of desensitized to it, and you just think, oh, "Okay, I'm done with this now." Like, calm it down a little bit. Um, I think as well, like the the the, the female lead, like Willie Scott, um, comp- <sighs> fucking hell, man, compared to Marion. <laughs> Like, what a step down. Like, I felt so bad for the actress because she has to spend the entire movie, like, crying and wailing and screaming and being terrified at everything. Like, ah, I I don't know why they chose to go in that direction with her because she's just annoying as fuck. Well, yeah, I don't don't get it. I don't get it at all. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of a shallow choice compared to to Marion. I don't I don't understand why they didn't do if they're gonna do a prequel. Uh, I think it would have been absolutely fascinating watching uh, Indiana Jones uh, kind of when he was younger and, and more starting out in his first encounters with with Belloc. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, that would have been fantastic. We could have had much more interaction with Belloc and, and Indy. Uh, they were a great pair of adversaries. I mean, they, they were fascinating and they had a long history, you know, because because Belloc says uh, in the in Raiders, you know, once again, Dr. Jones, we see there's nothing you can possess which I cannot take away. And you thought I had yeah. given up. You know, it's like you chose the wrong friends. This time it will cost you. So they have a long past. And it would have been fascinating watching Indy get the better of him, him getting the better of Indy. It would have been uh, absolutely fantastic. But no, they, they go off on this weird, uh, you know, kind of <sighs> dark pulp adventure, which... You know, if you look at it just as a pulp adventure with a different hero, it's a lot more palatable than uh, than what what came uh, looking at it as Indiana Jones. Yeah, um, th- this guy uh, he raised a good point here. Apparently, yes, <clears throat> Spielberg. <clears throat> excuse me, I can't speak anymore. Um, he was going through a bad divorce at the time, so the female lead um, in Temple of Doom is made to be annoying. Uh, yeah, I've I've heard him. Like he, he's, he's voiced quite a few misgivings about this movie. Um, in retrospect, he's basically said, "Yeah, I think I went a bit over the score with that one. I probably wouldn't have done it like that if I'd made it like a year or two later." Um, yeah, it, it it kind of is what it is. But like, I, I do love the opening sequence. Um, Me too. <laughs> it's it's in Club Obi Wan in like Shanghai or somewhere, and it's like it starts off this big crazy dance number, and then I love when Indy gets poisoned. 
and and so you know he's like looking for the antidote to this poison and i think willie scott the singer she's looking for this like big diamond that that india brought along and so they're both you know the things they're looking for are getting kicked around by the like um, by all the people fleeing in the middle of this big shootout. It's really good. It's a good fun sequence, very much like um, the one in Raiders of the Lost Ark to kick things off. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that bit's the best. I love it as well. <laughs> Indy's starting to feel the effects of this fucking um, poison, and it, like he's getting attacked by various people, and then like he. he bumps into a waitress and spins around and just fucking decks her. <laughs> <laughs> it is hilarious. And, <laughs> and, and Spielberg really wanted to do like this kind of Bugsy Berkeley, uh, you know, musical number. And I think having Willie Scott singing, you know, in Mandarin or Cantonese, I mean, whatever the, the lyrics are, anything goes. Uh, yeah. it, it's just it's just enchanting. It's a throwback. Uh, really, I mean, it, it is a throwback to, to the classic days of, of Hollywood. And I think subconsciously they were trying to basically make a, a rip roaring, uh, you know, period pulp story uh, and, and just lost track of, of what Indiana Jones is like. Because, you know, one of the things uh, that, that I have problems with is you said that Indiana Jones isn't quite right. And you're, you're spot on with that. Uh, for example, the Indiana Jones that was flustered when the girl had love you written on her, her eyelids is not the same Indy that's going to be all, you know, come here, doll face. And he, you know, whips her with his uh, whip and, and pulls her close and kisses her. That's that's not Indiana Jones. He was kind of awkward with, with women to some extent. Yeah, yeah. And it... it, it... This feels like an Indiana Jones that you would see a few years after Raiders when he's he's more experienced and maybe, you know, he's had more experience with women as well because then he's more confident with them um, like he is mm -hmm. here. Like, he's very fucking domineering when he's in situations with Willie. Um, yeah. You know, and it, it's, it, yeah, it just it doesn't feel like a prequel to the Indy that we saw in Raiders. Um, but, yeah, like... The, the the gist of this whole thing is that they managed to escape on a flight, but it's owned by the the guy who uh, um, who he was fighting in the the club. Basically, the guy is going to basically have Indy killed. Um, and I love how the the plan is basically just for the pilots to bail out and like leave Indy on the plane, um, so it's going to run out of fuel and crash <laughs> into a mountain. Like you know, you've just destroyed a plane that's worth like hundreds of thousands of dollars. So couldn't you just shoot him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's here. a big it's a big problem uh, uh i do i do love in the just to, before we pass it up the the moment in the nightclub club obi one where you know i the remains of nyahachi and she says this nyahachi is a really small guy <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's lao chi uh um, but like when he gets to the airport and he's like, nice try, Lao Chi. And then he closes the door of the plane and it just says like Lao Chi air free. <laughs> and he laughs and says goodbye, Dr. Jones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's weird how it segues into this movie because Raiders was very deliberate. You know, Indy's approached by these government guys. They want him to go on this, this quest to like find the Ark and stuff. And here he just kind of stumbles into all this shit that's going on. Like, they, they, they come out the plane on like a raft, uh, which they, they use to crash down into a river. <laughs> damn, that was lucky. Um, the, totally you know, a they, plot hole. <laughs> they, yeah, they get swept downstream and eventually they wind up in a village um, where, the, you know, everything's kind of dying. Like the landscape is really parched and stuff and all the food's run out. Um, all the children are missing. And that's where you find out that um, the village has had their sacred stone uh, taken away. Um, and all the children have been abducted. And so Indy's like, um, you know, he wants the stone, I think. He he even says it's for fame and glory, which, again, is just a wee bit weird compared to the Indy from Raiders, where he was all about the archaeology. You know, he, he wants this thing because it's it's going to bring him, like, well, fame and glory, really. Yeah, it, it's odd. I mean, now you could kind of make at least a little bit of a argument that, well, this was when he was young in his career and he had different aims. And and maybe by the end of, uh, you know, the movie where, uh, you know, the, the, 
he gives the stones back to the guy at the end and he says, I understand their power now. So he may have been humbled and, and uh, educated a little bit. Of course, then you can't have uh, him saying, you know, I don't believe in a lot of superstitious mumbo jumbo and Raiders. So it, it just, it just doesn't square, but at least in, in just terms of this character, you could maybe make a point that he was young, callow and, and foolish and uh, matures a little bit by the end of the movie and, and kind of comes to respect yeah. things other than fortune and glory, but it's it's a reach. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a bit of a weird one. Um, but either way, he does resolve to go and try and find this thing, and so they they, you know, fuck. You have more scenes of Willie just being terrified of everything. Like they they, <laughs> there the, she gets. There's one good moment that she gets where. Um, you know they they've made camp for the night and she's just getting chased by like bats and shit and she's like <laughs> running around the camp. Indy's just talking with short round like pretending like none of it's happening like they're just fucking ignoring her. And then there's one bit where like a giant snake appears behind her and she thinks it's the elephant's trunk on her and yeah. Indy's like absolutely terrified of this thing and she just grabs it and like throws throws it off her and he's like ah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are little moments that make uh, Temple of Doom a lot of fun. And, of course, the John Williams score is uh, superb. The Pancock Palace theme is is really beautiful. Uh, the photography is beautiful. The matte paintings of, of Pancock Palace are, are just gorgeous. Uh, ILM at, at, at its heights of its power. A great, great design. Great look. Yeah. Um, a lot of people talk about the, the dinner scene as well, where they're they're eating like Ugh. eyeball soup and chilled monkey brains and all that that stuff. Um, and, you know, Spielberg actually had a really interesting thing to say about this scene because people were criticizing him, like, "I can't believe this is what you think Indian food is like." Like, clearly, that's nothing like it. Um, and he responded by saying, "Well, yeah, but they were trying to freak these people out, so they they produced." The, the, sorry, the the characters in the movie were trying to freak out Indiana Jones and his and his accomplices, and they were giving them the kind of horrible food that they would imagine Indian people would eat, uh, like right. just this really barbaric stuff to try and mess with them. Um, I don't know, man. I think they just put it in there for shock value. Um, they yeah. did. They did. It's, <laughs> it's a nice try, Spielberg. But uh, yeah. yeah, just tell it like it is, man. Like you know what you did. <laughs> it was one uh, beautiful moment, I thought, where, uh, you know, these poor villagers scrape together this meal for them, and Willie Scott doesn't want to eat it, and he says, yeah. this is more people, this is more food than these people have in a in a month. Uh, you're, yeah. you're embarrassing me. Eat it. Yes, yeah. Um, again, just, like, really cuts to the chase, doesn't he? He's, yeah. like, straight up orders her to do what he's saying. It's like, you're embarrassing me. Just eat the food and shut up. Um, yeah, yeah. This is it's, it's, yeah, interesting. Interesting kind of actions from his character. Again, I don't think that's stuff you'd be allowed to show in a movie nowadays. Uh, but it, it definitely fits with who Indy is. Um, yeah, and yeah, I, I like the 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 scene in their rooms because there's def there's obviously this sexual tension between Indy and and Willie. Which yeah. says, I can't believe I'm saying this. It's like, oh, Willie's a dick. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I never put it together until you just said it now. And yeah, like, and now I it's never, quite clear. A called Willie. God. Anyway. Um, yeah. And like, you, uh, they both kind of argue with each other because they're both pissed off. And like, she wants him and he wants her. And like, he, he storms off into his room. And then he gets, an, he gets attacked by someone. Um, like he's trying to murder him in his sleep and like he's desperately fighting for his life and like you know Willie's just sitting in a room like oh yeah he'll come back he'll come back he's, he wants me you know <laughs> <laughs> yes there, there, uh, I mean she, she if she had just been toned down a little bit and given just a little bit more depth uh, Spielberg <laughs> I think could have <laughs> Booter Jockey uh, I, I think I think they could have uh, really played off the kind of screwball comedy blonde that I think Spielberg was trying to make her, but it needed to have a little more heart and a little more uh, you know restraint and and depth. You know, different surprising moments would have been would have been much better for that. Yeah, uh, I will say the actress is fucking hot. Like, um, there's oh, a yeah. bit later in the movie where she's she changes outfits and man, she's got some figure on her. Yeah, damn. 
Well, you know, she became Mrs. Spielberg. Uh, yeah, she eventually. did something right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a funny, there's a shot of, of uh, Ford and, and George Lucas and Spielberg and Willie like laying down on the, against the wall, you know, their heads up against the wall, laying on the floor. And she's got, you know, her arms in, in his. So uh, as he was getting his divorce, you know, she was, she was, uh, she, yeah, she had she plans. Was going for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was, there's a, there's one here. Uh, Alison Duty was the hottest. Yeah, she was gorgeous. Um, she still is. I think I've seen I've, I've seen pictures of her quite recently, and she's still stunning. Um, she was a she was a knockout. Uh, I guess the the women in these movies, uh, though, I, I I think I'd want Marion. Honestly, she was just so gorgeous in that gown and 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 her her eyes. You know that that blue of her eyes, that gray blue, uh, just striking. Uh, yeah. She was she was something. Yeah, she she had real like heart, you know. Yeah, like a, just an interesting character. Um, but yeah, like the, it it does ultimately culminate in them finding like a secret passage that leads them down into this like underground temple, and I think that's where they witness their first human sacrifice. Um, and again, like fuck, th- this movie um, it doesn't hold back. Like you you see the. The, the priest just reaching right into this guy's chest and pulling his heart out of his body. I don't know how that works or anything, but apparently it does. Um, <laughs> magic. Well, it's magic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then that's not enough. Like, then the guy gets fucking lowered into a volcano and, like, set on fire and stuff. Like, damn, like, this movie is not messing around. And, and uh, when he's on fire, the heart bursts into flames in Mola Ram's hand, yeah. which is... Uh, and he's just doing that maniacal laugh, like, ah! <laughs> Oh, no. You don't believe, Dr. Jones. Yeah. You will. You're about to become a true believer. <laughs> it was it was uh well done. I mean, that's a very memorable, memorable scene. And of course, then they put Willie Scott in the uh the cage. Yeah. And they're lowering her over the lava. And I'm sorry, but I think I'm pretty sure, check me, but you know, the heat rising off of that lava would have fried her even before she uh she touched it. Uh, oh, what it did with the other guy? Like he got lowered in. He was on fire before he got anywhere near the lava. So, yeah, like it, it should have killed her easily. Um, yeah, the, the guy Livin's flame pointing out here. This scene was cut in the UK up until fairly recently. Yeah, it really was. Oh like, my god! There's so much of that scene you didn't see. Um, the, the whole bit where he reaches into the guy's chest, you didn't see that. You didn't see the wound kind of close up again in the UK version. Uh, and you didn't see the guy catch fire uh, when he was getting lowered in. So all of that stuff was cut from the UK oh, broadcast. Shit. That's terrible. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, only now can you see it. Like they've they've given you the the uncut version. Uh, so uh, was it classified as a video nasty? It it pretty much was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> back at like when I was a kid, like they were really quite strict about what they would show on TV. Like even after the the watershed, and so even. Yeah, even at that, like late at night, you would still get these movies that would have the, the goriest scenes cut out of them. Like, you know, in Robocop, where, where Murphy gets fucked up with, yeah. like, you know, shotguns, like his arms getting blown off and stuff. Yeah, none of that was shown. That is uh, so I, weird. I mean, why the, I mean, back in 67 or 68 on Money Python, uh, they showed that, you know, Sam, Sam Peckinpah's Salad Days sketch. Where you know there's blood spurting and an arm gets ripped off and yeah. uh, you know a keyboard is rammed through a guy's you know guts and and uh, I mean it's to comic effect but still it's gory I mean and they were showing nudity and and everything that's good and proper uh, in Monty Python and what what the hell happened to you guys It was it was really weird like they were just big into censorship back then like back in the the eighties early nineties. Um, and eventually they calmed down with it, but yeah, it was it was a weird one. Um, and so as a kid, you grew up with these these movies that were kind of sanitized, um, but you could tell that something had been taken out a lot of the time because sometimes the edits were really choppy because they'd obviously been done in a rush to make it suitable for TV. Um, and you it's know, pathetic. The, yeah, it's it's just weird. And you know, the the ironic thing, we had to. <laughs> I don't know if you know about this, dude, but like we had page three in the yes. UK, like with with our newspapers, and so you just get a topless woman. <laughs> page three, it was great. 
which made me love you guys, made me love the UK. I mean, my yeah. God, uh, Monty Python. Did you ever watch uh, The Young Ones? Mm. Oh, The Young Ones is cracking, yeah. I Rick love Neal, The wasn't Young it? Ones. One of my favorite shows of all time. Uh, talk about just madness and anarchy and brilliance. Oh, my God. It was one of my favorite shows. That was, it was, oh, The Young Ones was great fun, yeah. Um, but, yeah, speaking, speaking of Indiana Jones, um, yeah, so, like, like you say, you know, um, she get Willie gets lowered into this pit, like, and Indy's been possessed by like yeah. the power of of Mola Ram, you know, and he's, um, yeah, he, he's just like you know fully on board with what they're doing now, and it's not until short round like hits him with a, a wooden um, like torch, like, yeah, burn- it's fire, yeah, like the the burning, the pain of it just seems to snap him out of it, and so. Yeah, you you get like big fight scenes there, um, and there's there's a great moment where like short round is fighting like this kid who's been possessed as well. Indy's like fighting this this you know henchman that he's up against. They're both punching them, and the the music's in time with with both of them like doing the punching, and the camera like pans from one to the other. It's just a great little scene. Like I love how choreographed it is. Um, it was great. And I think somehow we skipped over one of my favorite movie moments in the movie where um, Indiana Jones is trapped in this trap where the ceiling is coming down. And, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And he calls to Willie, and Willie's got to stick her hand in the filth. <laughs> yeah, to, the, uh, there's bugs everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> nasty bugs everywhere. And she's like, I, I don't want to do it. He sticks his, his face out and he goes, We are going to die. And then he gives her this <laughs> hilarious frown. It's just. <laughs> He looks so aggrieved. It's a really funny moment. I mean, there there are some really wonderful moments in this movie, and I've come to I've come to love it uh, over over time because I can divorce it. This is not Indiana Jones. It's just it's just not. It's a it's a grand old pulp adventure uh, featuring some generic pulp hero, uh, and and I can look at it at that at that level, and I just. Yeah, there's dead people in here. There are going to be dead people people. in here. (laughs) Well done, Naked Fame. Uh, Yeah, man. I so it's it's a cool movie, uh, but it is it is deeply flawed. And of course, the the climax has some of the worst editing. Uh, I mean, the bridge, dude. The bridge. Yeah. um, Yeah. It's like there's a very distinct difference between like the the size of this gorge when you see it in a long shot and when you see it from above when it's clearly a matte painting. Um, yeah, yeah, like the, that's 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 a bit goofy. Um, yeah, totally the, the goofy. whole the whole way that plays out with with uh, Molaram fighting Indy and like he falls off the bridge and he's hanging on, um, and you know the the stones like burn out the bag and everything. It, it's yeah, it, it's a bit of a weird climax to the film, um, but I mean, I don't know. I, I think there's there's been so many set pieces up until that moment. Um, like the the minecart chase is really good. Um, although I never quite understood when he when he knocks over that big container of water, like the water tower, and it floods the tunnels. Like these guys went through like enormous tunnels that led down into big chasms filled with right. lava. I don't know how the water like went over <laughs> all of that and like still got to them, but you know, it's magic. It's Shiva. Yeah, again, uh, it's you know, like the, yeah. The movie just totally not giving a fuck. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, Kali Ma, Kali Ma. Of course, Kali is the destructive aspect of the uh, Hindu uh, uh, deity. I mean, it it appears to be. Um, yeah, hang on, lady. We're going for, We're going a, ride. for a ride. <laughs> Short round was pretty cool, and he was in the tradition of you know kid sidekicks of these kinds of of heroes. Oh, and we forgot about Dan Aykroyd at the airport. What was he again? He um, was a mechanic. He was just the mechanic oh. that was uh, ushering Indiana to the plane yeah. uh, that he'd gotten ready. Just a little cameo for Dan Aykroyd. Forgot to mention that. I, I love as well when people fall into the river and the crocodiles start eating them. Um, and you know, clearly you don't see it because you can't you can't do that with real crocodiles. Um, but you just you hear like a, a scream, like the Wilhelm scream, like ah, 
Uh, and then you just see a crocodile like rolling around with like a piece of rag in its mouth. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, ah, yeah. that's another guy got killed there. Fine. Aye. Works Fair well. Or... It's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's valid. I mean, uh, they did that actually. Um, for example, when the propeller hits the German in Raiders uh, and he, he raises his arms and then you see blood splat on, uh, I think, the gas tank or, or yes. something along yeah. those lines, which is a brilliant way, a very cinematic way. Uh, to kind of keep down the the gore and also save money on on practical effects uh, and special effects, it's it's well done. You know, cinematically, it's just like a shorthand. Spielberg is a is a master of uh, yeah. understanding. I mean, he could if he could draw, he would have been a great uh, comic book illustrator because the he thinks in terms of those uh, those wonderful cuts. And, uh, and and Spielberg is a master with the camera. Yeah. He he really uh, he packs so much into a shot. Uh, E.T. is another one that uh, really was was Spielberg at his directoral uh, height of powers. You know all sorts of of wonderful, uh, fluid, uh, narratively compact shots in in E.T., which is another masterpiece in my opinion. I know some people don't like it. It, it touches my heart. I love E.T. Uh, but I think I think Raiders is is Spielberg's masterpiece. But I think E.T. is maybe Spielberg's emotional masterpiece. Uh, well, I love the fact that they didn't tell Drew Barrymore that uh, E.T. was a puppet, and so the bit where he dies, like they were filming her actual reaction <laughs> to it. Poor, poor Drew. <laughs> totally fucked her up. That's awful. <laughs> That's awful. And then you know she ver she became addicted to drugs and sex uh, later yeah, on in life. Sure, well, I'm sure, they weren't related. <laughs> You should have turned the, told the kid that the poor E.T. was just a puppet. <laughs> I was going to say as well, like, you know, when we were talking about, like, some of the comedy scenes of this movie, I love the bit where India has got, like, a sword from one of the, the henchmen and he chases them off screen and then just see him pause, like, right in front of the camera and he's like, Ugh! and then, like, he just turns and flees and, like, a hundred guys, like, go and pursue him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, which is almost like an homage to uh, Star Wars, where Han Solo is is yelling and chasing the the stormtroopers yeah, yeah, yeah. until he runs into a band of them, and then he runs away. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Harrison such, Ford, such a good bit of that. Oh uh, uh, yeah, he was great. The the movie also shows you like you know what happens when guys with guns go up against guys with bows and arrows, and you know it it's not like Wakanda. Like the the guys with the guns went out pretty handily, <laughs> like at the climax of this movie. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, it, it's a it's a fascinating, interesting experiment that doesn't quite work. But if you can divorce it from the the context of Indiana Jones, I think it's uh, enjoyable enough. You might just want to fast forward a little bit through the interminable like thirty minutes of solid shooting, ducking, punching, etc. Yeah, yeah, it does get a little bit overwhelming at times. And yeah, like I say, I, there there always just feels like there's something a bit off kilter about that movie, um, and it. I, I think maybe Spielberg's head wasn't quite in the game. If he was in the middle of a divorce while he was yeah. making this, like, yeah, it, it's it's a bit of an odd one. Um, but it does lead us into the 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 last Indiana Jones movie that got made. Yep, because there was nothing beyond this one, uh, which was Last Crusade. Um, which, you know, I, I think that movie gets a lot of shit uh, mm -hmm. from people for being a bit formulaic and, and a bit like unimaginative compared to the others. But honestly, I've got such a soft spot for it. Um, I love the relationship between Indy and his dad. I love that Sean Connery's in it. Um, I love the fact that he's like 12 years older than Harrison Ford, but he looks about <laughs> 30 years older than him. Like, it's just yeah. great. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it, for me, it's just like it was a perfect way to cap the, the the whole series um i i'd like that um yeah like you get a bit of resolution for indy and his personal life and like his relationship with his father i think i think it's a great movie like i don't know how you feel about it well my feelings about it uh have been uh, fairly complex critical drinker i i kind of mentioned at the at the start of this before we went on that uh uh as a uh out of respect uh to you and in this process, I decided, uh, by God, I'm going to watch this again. Uh, it had been, I don't know, uh, maybe eight years, 10 years since uh, I last saw it. And, uh, you know, sometimes one thing uh, can stick in your craw when you see a movie and, and just kind of 
taint the whole experience from the from the ground up. Mm. Uh, I initially, when I when I first saw it, I just could not get over the fact that I felt that they wasted uh, Sean Connery as a fusty academic when, you know, when you get right down to it, he's the one guy that I could imagine that might be even tougher than Indiana Jones. And I kind of picture it as like this guy, is, you know, when I first heard that Sean Connery was cast, I was like, oh, shit. Can you imagine like this guy was was the role model for Indy and Indy maybe never, uh, you know, uh, measured up to, to this guy's fucking, you know, badass excellence. But of course, he's, you know, in, in the twilight of his career. And and over the course of this movie, Indy's going to prove to be, uh, you know, as good or better and uh and pass the mantle so on i thought that that would be a fantastic movie and and i just could not get over the fact that uh this was not the movie i had made in my head when i heard that sean connery uh was in it and and that stuck with me for many many years however uh as time is has gone by and i've had the chance to uh you know kind of just adjust to that idea uh, and my friend Gary Ambrosi, he, for Christmas, he sent me a, a, a copy of the, uh, the Grail Diary. Uh, it's a very, very amazing uh, piece of art that uh, is packed with this stuff and sent me uh, a Holy Grail uh, duplicate of the one in the movie. And oh, nice. It, it is. And, and, you know, reading the Grail, uh, reading the, the journal uh, and then watching it. I'm so glad I watched it uh, yesterday. Uh, and I was able to enjoy it on its own terms without any kind of preconceptions. And it, it really transformed the experience for me. And I genuinely enjoyed it. Uh, I, I, I see now what they were trying to do. I see that it works. Uh, I still think that my movie in my head would have been absolutely fantastic, but this movie is excellent as well. And, um, so in that filter, you know, I, I was able to see it fresh and uh, I'm ready to, to, to talk about it on its own terms. Um, I think there's so many great things about this movie and great moments in this movie. Yeah. I, I mean, I love the fact that Connery played against type because you would expect right. him to play like the suave, um, debonair, like hero type character who's a bit older now, but he's, he's still kicking ass. And like, exactly like you say, but I, I think it's a testament to Sean, uh, Connery as an actor that yeah. he was able to play this like, you know, dorky um, academic <laughs> yeah. type and still make it work. You know, um, yeah. I remember uh, there, was, there was an interview with uh, I watched with Alec Baldwin when he was talking about making Hunt for Red October and he was told that he was going to be playing opposite Sean Connery. And he's like, ah, oh, you know, that's fine. You know, I saw him in, in um, Last Crusade and he was, you know, he's, he's old and he's bald and he's, you know, playing like a, a kind of dorky, you know, you know, a history professor type character. Like, I'm not going to be intimidated by him. And then Connery fucking rocked up on set with like the, the salt and pepper wig and like the, the beard and he was in the big Russian Navy uniform and he just looked absolutely like, you know, just an absolute killer character. And uh, Baldwin just went like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> this guy is going to dominate every fucking scene that he's in, I can tell. Sean Connery is a is a master, a master. The greatest Bond that there ever was. Uh, a hell of a an actor. And uh, Hunt for Red October is the movie that taught me how to do uh, Sean Connery impression. You know, there's always like a phrase that yes. when you're trying to do an impression, you you latch onto. Like with uh, James Mason, it was uh, in Evil Under the Sun, where he was uh, with Inspector Hercule Poirot, and Poirot's in interrogating him, and he says this line. And so you see, Inspector, I have no alibi, and that was the the key to doing uh, a James Mason. But for Sean Connery, it was. We sail into history. Yeah, that that's the way to do uh, Sean Connery and the rest. It was uh, always, for for me. It was always the, the scene from The Rock where he's talking to Ed Harris and he's like, "This is an act of lunacy, General Sir. Personally, I think you're a fucking idiot." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's a great one. Or there's the one in uh, you know the uh, Untouchables. That's the Chicago way. 
You know? <laughs> yeah. There's a great bring one. A you bring a gun. That's the Chicago way. Another one from The Rock. Losers always whine about their best. Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, he he's just he's just magnificent. His bond, yeah. I don't know. Maybe uh, at some point, uh, you know, uh, you'll you'll come on my channel. We could talk about uh, James Bond or something because that's I, I would rich, love that. I rich love mine, that. rich uh, mine. I've got I've got such a a, a fondness for the the classic Bond movies. Me uh, too. I I mean, obviously, I love the Connery era. I've got a real soft spot for Roger Moore as Bond. <laughs> like I, I I've reviewed. Uh, one of his movies, and you know, I think he could have done something really special if he'd been given better scripts. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah I, I would happily come on and talk about Bond for for a good few hours. <laughs> it, it's amazing. I mean, so many great things. How do you feel about Daniel Craig? I know it's an aside, but uh, what do you think of his Bond? I don't like him. Not at all. Uh, Not even in Casino Royale. It, Casino Royale was probably his best, um, and it, it gave you a little hint of where they were. They might have gone with this. I loved the fact that Casino Royale was stripped back, and it, it wasn't. It didn't rely on crazy gadgets or anything like that. It was a much more grounded yeah. sort of movie. Um, never particularly liked Craig as Bond. He always felt like he was playing him uh, without the, the sophistication of the other yeah. actors. He didn't have the suaveness. He didn't have the debonair kind of Bond attitude that you would want. Um, yeah, he can definitely do an action scene. No denying that. Like the guy's, um, he's physically well built, and he can he can definitely do that stuff. But um, you know, can he walk into a casino wearing a tuxedo and looking like he owns it? No, nah, no way. Yeah, uh, no, and that's a good point. He he looks like, yeah, he looks like a, a a fucking military man that's just been put into civilian clothes. Um, and I think Bond should have a bit more ability to blend in than that. Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree. Although I I do I love Casino Royale. I think it's a good movie. Mads Mikkelsen was great, but uh, that's a digression. I'm sorry. Uh, we no, can no, get back to uh, it, Last Crusade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I I think again the, the the Indiana Jones movies they're always known for like their opening um, ten minutes where you get like a, a little a little side quest almost that's that's you know kind of related to the main narrative but it's like it's like a little mini movie in its own right and in this case you get to see young indiana jones where he's you know he does his very first adventure and it's played by river phoenix who i uh, a great choice actually from um and you know a great actor from back in the day it was like such a you know tragic end for him like his career was cut short so oh, yeah. so suddenly um but yeah, like I love the way it transitions from him into Indiana Jones. Like, you know, they, they put the hat on and then it comes up and like Indy just takes a punch and they're on like a, a big tanker in the middle of a storm. Um, and, it, you know, you get this great, again, another action set piece where like the, they're on board a ship that ends up getting sunk. Um, and it's just like Indy recovering another treasure. Um, so again, I think it's a nice little way to tie into the, the, the movie it gives you uh, just a little glimpse of Sean Connery when you know you realize that, like, okay, Indy's relationship with his dad is going to be an important aspect of this this movie, um, and that's that's kind of where it goes. Like the whole reason Indy gets drawn into this is because his dad was working on uh, some project um, and he's gone missing, and Indy has to go and find him. Yeah. Um, and so I like that. You know, it gives you more of an insight into Indy as a person, like what is his, his personal life like and what was his upbringing like? Because these are all things that you never knew before. Yeah, I in, in this opening, I was uh, pretty underwhelmed uh, by the opening when I first saw it, but now watching it again, I mean, look at look at what it is. It really is kind of an origin story for, for Indiana Jones with seeds that will pay off later in the movie. I mean, I, I really did admire the structure of the screenplay. Uh, this time around because you know uh, he sees the these guys that are you know he's on a boy scout expedition he yeah goes into of course a he's a boy scout <laughs> <laughs> probably an eagle scout almost yeah. certainly and he sees uh, a guy who is dressed in a leather jacket and uh, a, a fedora just like Indiana Jones uh, and they have found in an excavation the uh, the cross of Coronado and he recognizes it from, I guess, from his dad or 
or, you know, his own studies or whatever. And he says, I love it how Phoenix, River Phoenix says that belongs in a museum. And in profile, he looks a lot like a young Harrison Ford uh, yeah. would look. And that conviction that he brings and he steals it and, and, and tries to, to take it away from these, these robbers. And they uh, have a pursuit of him, and he gallops, and, and they're in a car, and, you know, they're after this kid. And, uh, you know, he gets on a train, and uh, in that, in the course of that little mini episode, we find out uh, how Indy got the scar under on his chin. Yeah, we find he out, up the bullwhip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he picks up the bullwhip, and, and, and the first time he uses it, he hits himself in the mouth. Uh, and, and actually, it's really cool because he goes in with a friend. Uh, a little, a little fat kid that goes in there, and uh, and while they're watching this, the the, the friend goes, ah, and then he reaches and says, "It's just a snake. Calm down." He tosses the snake away, but it's yeah. not. He gets the phobia of snakes when he falls into the 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 zoo section of this uh, train car and a ton of snakes, yeah, which I guess scars him psychologically. Uh, and uh, oh my God, what a what a beautiful beautiful sequence uh where it, kind of the torch is handed symbolically for, uh, from this 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 archaeologist this raider uh to indy when he when he says you lost today kid but you don't have to like it and he gives him his hat yeah i love that as well like the, this this guy's made a good point i always wanted them to follow up on the guy that indy bases himself on like you never yeah. really know who this guy was or anything he's just just a random guy but indy obviously liked his style and so he ends up copying it um and he liked yeah. he liked indy i mean there was one point where he's like galloping off and he and they show him on a long shot and he just has this little smile uh come up on his face this this guy yeah yeah, it's, it's it's really cool. Like just it get that insight into how he came to be. Um, but yeah, so you know the, the the gist of this story then is that um, I think his father was was hunting for the Holy Grail. He's been kind of consumed with that quest for most of his life, and I think um, as you gradually discover, like that got in the way of their relationship when Indy was young. You know, his mm -hmm. father was so preoccupied with his work that he never spent time with with Indiana. Um, and they've they've got a very like distant relationship now, um, and so Indy goes to try and track him down, and I think the the first place he goes is Venice, isn't it? That's where um, that's where um, his father was last seen, and and he was working with a, a German lady named Elsa Schneider. Yes, yes, Elsa Schneider, and and, and how beautifully again the opening sets up the script because. Uh, when when he bursts in on his dad to tell him about the cross of Coronado that he stole back, uh, his dad is, uh, cal calm down, count down. And then he starts counting, it's just no in Greek. Yes. And, and, and so having him t taught him uh, this uh, these languages saves his life in the climax where the you know name of God is the, the path he has to take. Yes, yeah, because he, yeah. Because the name of God is spelled out in in Greek rather than you know English, obviously. And it like starts with for, an I, damn it. <laughs> yeah, because he's looking for Jehovah, and he's like J. Oh, fuck. oh <laughs> almost dies. <laughs> um, yeah, and so like Elsa is, you know, she's gorgeous. Like um, she's a proper blonde bombshell. Um, but I think you you find out that. You know, his father had gotten as far as like tracking down a um, what would it even have been? It's like a, it's like a church or something that they have to go to. Um, yeah, it was a, a former church that was converted to a library. Yes, uh, and and uh, you know the 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 thing that guides Indy over there is because uh, Henry Jones sends him his diary in the yes. mail, and so when he's disappeared. You know, the fact that he has this, uh, and I think it's like a bookmarked or something uh, with a place that is in uh, in Venice. And so that's where he logically, plus the you know fact that uh, Schneiderman was uh, working with him there. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really seamless how they move uh, Indy to this location. It doesn't feel forced or, uh, or fake. It's, it's well done script. 
Yeah. Um, and I love as well, like, because one of the, the things that you see from India at the beginning is when he's talking to a class and he says that X <laughs> never marks the spot. <laughs> and then, like, he, he gets into the library and sure enough, like, he has to <laughs> fucking X marks the spot. And he has to, like, break the, uh, you know, the, the tiles that are yeah. there so he can get underground. Um, and there's, like, a librarian who's just stamping books. <laughs> and so, like, when he goes to that, it's like, <laughs> and they're like, what the fuck? Coordinates <laughs> and the little, the little librarian looks at his, like, stamp, like it's done it, and, and then does it again. It's very, very funny. Well yeah, done. Yeah, nice, nice little bit of, uh, nice bit of comedy there. Um, and, yeah, when they go underground, like, it's, um, the place is filled with rats, I think. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, yeah. Like a, it's like a kind of sewer system, but it leads them to, like, the tomb um, where, like, Christian knights from the Crusades have been buried. Um, and that's like the first clue on their their um, you know their hunt, uh, but the, the 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 place is like full of um, full of gas, isn't it? It's like full of petroleum or something like that. It's like a natural spring. Yeah. Uh, and so when they get down there, the, the, it's great because there's like an inscription on the wall that uh, Elsa spots, and she's like, um, "What's that?" And India's like, oh, "It's the Ark of the Covenant." She's like, "Are you sure?" I just see him make this this gesture, like, yeah, pretty sure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that was so great, and and John Williams uh, echoes the uh, the Ark of the Covenant theme from Raiders uh, during that segment, which is a really nice nod. That's that's cool. Yeah, it's uh, a, that's a great moment. But like, they they're able to get information off the the sarcophagus. I think like Indy does a sketch of it or something. Like he traces it um, because like it's part of a tablet that they've been looking for. Uh, and that's when the dudes just drop like a, a lighter into this place that's full of um, full of natural gas, and you just yeah. see these flames go right along the um, the you know the sewer that they've gone through, and they have to like you know they have to take shelter inside the sarcophagus, and it's it's you know you get like that freaky scene where like there's always like insects or rodents or something like the the rats start coming in through the top of it and like they're landing on Elsa and she's like ah oh, freaking out. Um, but yeah, it's it's all pretty well done. Like I like this this whole segment. Um, it is, and it's funny when uh, you know how how he says, "I think I see a way out," and then they cut to an outdoor cafe just outside the library museum, and there's a little light grate, a sewer grate, and uh, yeah. it comes out. And they come out wet uh, amid all the diners. It's a pretty funny little moment. Well done. Yeah, yeah. Um... And it leads to like another chase where, and I love this bit where like they end up on like speedboats, like getting attacked by like these these. They're they're kind of like an ancient order that swore to protect the Holy Grail and, and stop it ever getting discovered. Right. Uh, and the, the you know they're they're on like speedboats where they're getting chased through like docks and stuff. And like I love when one of them leaps onto the back of the boat and like Indy's wrestling with them and his gun goes off and it keeps like shooting the windshield right next to where Elsa is steering the boat. And she just like flicks her head around and she fucking glares at them like, you fuck, stop shooting at me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's well done. Uh, Kasim being uh, part of the brotherhood of the cruciform sword, I believe is yes. uh, sworn to protect the grail. And uh, so he's not a bad guy. And ultimately he, uh, well, I mean, they're fighting. They're the ones fighting. And then we get uh, to a scene that uh frankly is is kind of embarrassing uh the the boat getting chopped up by the propeller uh of the thing look man uh, a boat in water it gets hit by that propeller it's going to get knocked to the side it's going to spin around it's not going to be like it's fastened on a conveyor belt and being fed relentlessly into this yeah. chop chop that's that's terrible well, I'm, I'm Sorry. pretty sure that like propellers on boats, like, are they not meant to be under the water? Like, it'd be pretty weird yes. for it to be up like that. Like, this, yeah. this thing's churning like a giant fan. But yeah, fuck it, I don't mind. Yeah, yeah. It's just a, I, I just look at it as like, oh my god, come on, dude. I, I like the the dialogue <laughs> there where where Indy's, um, you know, he's got the guy like pinned down, and he's he's saying like, you're going to die here, and uh, the guy's like, well, the guy says to him actually, we're gonna we're both going to die here, and Indy just goes, then we'll die. Uh, and his response is like, "Well, my soul's prepared. How is yours?" And yeah, so that's when Indy has to like, you know, get him out of there. But like, right, he, he explains like what they're what they're there to do. Um, and obviously, Indy's priority is finding his father. And right, that's when he, he finds out that he's been taken to a castle in the 
is it like the Austrian Alps or something? Yes, it was in the Austrian Alps. And uh, one one thing I found extremely curious about that entire sequence is uh, how kind of gray, dismal, and ordinary they made Venice look. Uh, I, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful romantic spots. Uh, surely they could have done a little more production design and and kind of spruced it up and made it uh more interesting i mean that boat chase happens into something that's so industrial it could have just been in the fucking port of houston for god's sakes uh, i mean weird they, they do have a gondola at least like there's a guy that gets knocked <laughs> yeah, off the gondola but, but when you look at it i mean you would expect you know more saturated color and more flair and and uh, the, the, it was kind of probably- sloppy yeah, no, I get what you mean. Um, I will say, like, Venice is a bit of a shithole. Like, I've been yeah. there, and it stinks. Like, there's, yeah. a, there's a really weird smell there. Like, the canals are really fetid. Like, they don't circulate or anything. So, like, God, it just smells like decomposing bodies. Um, so, yeah, it's not quite the – it's not like the paradise of romance that it's made out to be. Um, and it's usually packed with tourists as well. Like, you can barely move in the place. Uh, uh, but yeah, I get what you mean. When it's in Italy, like the weather is usually gorgeous, so like you sh- you should be able to like film that at least. Uh, and it is a bit weird that they go through docklands rather than canals. Uh, but they they wanted it for that ship scene so they could have the propeller bit. You know? Right. It's, what are you gonna do? But uh, yeah. it's just odd for a Spielberg production. They're usually pretty uh, well, uh, you know, production designed, but. Oh. I was going to say as well, I love the bit between um, him and Elsa where it's like, I, you said don't go between them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was funny. That was yeah. that was actually pretty well done. Um, but yeah. yeah, like the, the, the yeah, I like uh, <laughs> when they go to Castle Brumwald in, in Austria um, and Harrison Ford does, I swear, the worst Scottish accent I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so tell him that lord mcleod is here to view the tapestries <laughs> <laughs> well at least the butler isn't fooled he says, if you're if you're a scottish lord i'm you know something i'm mickey it. mouse yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's when he punches him solves the problem yeah i love as well where he's like uh yeah, you know lord whatever and his lovely assistant and he fucking grabs elsa and just like hauls her up <laughs> <laughs> right in front of him. <laughs> she uh, was, uh, yeah, yeah, that was good. But, and, uh, and of course, then uh, you know he finds, uh, you know, he finds uh, Sean Connery, his dad. Uh, very cleverly, he knows the room that's wired for security is the room he's in. Yeah, and I love how, like, the first time you see his dad, he tries to knock him out with a vase, just like cracks him over the head with it. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, "Oh, it's me, Dad." He's like, and Sean Connery's like, "Oh, thank God!" Uh, and then you see him like pick up the vase, and he's like, "Ah, it's a fake," <laughs> you know. He's My goodness! <laughs> <laughs> he was scared he'd smashed a Ming vase, and it turns out it's a fake. Yeah, it's a it's reproduction. A... Um, but I love when the, you know he, he's uh, you know they get captured by the the Germans, and that's when you discover that Elsa is a Nazi. You know, she's been working with them the whole time. Um, and you know, Connery's just like, I always knew she was, she was, uh, a, a Nazi. And Harrison Ford's like, how do you know that? And it's like, she talks in her sleep. <laughs> yeah. But then, then, yeah, but then yeah. he just moves. He really moves quickly. Cause like Indiana Jones just looks at him like, what the fuck? And he's like, oh, I didn't trust her. Why did you? <laughs> 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 yeah i know and then and it's like i'll have the diary dr jones and oh, you're crazy do you think he'd be so stupid as to bring the diary yeah. uh and, and then and then and then and he's like making a face and he says you brought it i should have mailed it to the marx brothers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a great line a great line um. oh god that was good I love as well where uh, Elsa's talking to to Indy and she's like, "Oh, it was wonderful our time together." And like Connery thinks she's talking to him, and she's like, "Wow, thank you. It was rather wonderful." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then he looks and sees her kissing him, and he makes a face. He's like, oh. "Yeah." I just love as well when the German guy comes in and he's like, "Ah, oh, this is how we say goodbye in Germany." And 
punches on one and it like because his head gets snapped back by it like it hits connery as well yeah and it's like uh i liked her goodbye better <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of great lines uh the, you're right the interplay between sean connery and his dad uh are really really good and and i'm glad i was able to uh finally let go of my uh uh preconceptions and the movie i wanted to make in my head and uh, accept this movie uh on its own terms yeah yeah um, and I love the, the whole escape sequence as well, <laughs> where uh, Connery, like, he, he's got, like, a lighter, and he's trying to, like, I think he's trying to burn the ropes that's holding them in their, their place, and it burns his hand, so he's like, ah, oh, fuck, and, like, throws it away, and, like, it ends up setting the whole curtains on fire. Um, yeah. And, you know, yeah. They're, 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 like, desperately trying to back away from this place. Um, but, you know, like... He just keeps fucking things up. It's like later on when they're uh, they're in a plane and he's trying to shoot at an enemy aircraft and he yeah. ends up like destroying their tail. Um, and it, instead of admitting that he's fucked up, he just goes to his son like, "I'm sorry, son. They got us." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was well done as well. Uh, good, great little moments between them. Uh, and I don't want to jump ahead too much, but uh, it it kind of culminates. They, they have a few uh, instances where Henry Jones really gets redeemed, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, where they're being the great Zeppelin scene and, and then they're being pursued by, uh, you know, in the plane. They have, they're forced to land because Sean Connery shot out their own tail. But then, he, you know, the, the plane is making a strafing run, is going to finish them off, and, and he, Henry grabs his umbrella and uh, shoes the the birds up in the air uh, mm. to uh, interfere with the plane and, and takes the plane down. Uh, that's very, very cool. Yeah. Like, yeah, and he, he gives uh, he gives a little speech. It's like, I suddenly remembered my Charlemagne. May my armies be the rocks in the trees and the birds in the sky. And he just walks away with his umbrella over his shoulder, like cool as fuck. <laughs> and and the, the look they, they hold on Indy's <clears throat> face and, 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 and you see that, that dawning respect uh yeah. it's, it's a beautiful beautiful moment it's uh, all, the the whole movie is about him reconnecting with his father yeah like it starts off very adversarial and it, indy's got no real respect from it and you know as far as he's concerned his dad's just a pain in the ass that he's got to try and carry around with him uh but gradually you know he he demonstrates his knowledge um, and his superior like experience and it, it impresses Indy and by the end like they've they've just got this great relationship and I, I love that you know it comes down to Indy being asked to trust his father when his father asked him to let the grail go you know like yeah. I, like I mentioned earlier I love that scene between the two of them I think it's so well played out um, it, it is uh you know and Ilsa you know she had that gleam in her eye uh you know trying to grab it and and then he drops her and then Indy's in the same damn position yes. and despite his wisdom I mean this is this is the holy grail for God's sakes this is the genuine article his dad I I can almost get it Junior let it go yeah Indiana yeah. no that's what he says Indiana Indiana it yeah it's uh and he lets it go he, it's uh it's a tough it's a tough choice yeah uh, anyway i didn't mean to skip to the end but it's just uh no, you know, talking no, about it's... the highlights of their relationship it's uh uh pretty remarkable no it's it's fine and like you say that you know the the whole like chase sequence with them i love the bike sequence as well uh yeah. where where he just throws the the flagpole into the spokes of the 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 bike and it just catapults through the air again it's all it's all practical effects like this stuff looks incredible love it yeah yeah um and they need to they they basically need to get the um the book back they need the the grail diary um, right because it has the three clues uh for the trials that they will have to have to get in so it's not just finding the the place with the map which is the pages that uh you know got ripped out uh that that brody and, and sala have but now they have to actually get the damn grail diary back because it has the three quotes of the breath of God, the, the, the word of God, the, you know, righteous path. The path that, of uh, God. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it as, as well. Like uh, when Indy says to him, you don't remember. And he's like, I wrote them in my diary so I wouldn't have to remember. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah I, I, someone's just quoted it fucking right as I said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Solar Sailor 41. Well done. <laughs> nice one. Uh, so they have to take a Zeppelin to... Uh, oh, no, that, like, no, sorry. That, that, that's already been... like I was going to say that the bit where they get on the Zeppelin... Um, I love when when Indy's um, spots like the Gestapo guy who yeah. recognizes him. I just throws him right out the window, and he just goes, "No ticket!" And uh, you know, everyone in the the, the aircraft's like, oh, "I've got my ticket! I've got my ticket!" <laughs> yeah, because he's disguised as a porter, which yeah. uh, is is really awesome. Uh, what a what a great! It's a, it's a, a lot of fun. This movie, but the the oh, movie also it takes the time to step back a little bit. Like it gives you that little quiet scene between Indy and his dad, um, yeah. because Indy's pissed at him that he was never around when he was a kid and he never supported him or anything like that. And you know he tries to defend himself by saying, "Well, I never, I never told you to brush your teeth or go to bed early or anything like that because I respected you and I wanted you to be your own man." Um, and you know, it's it just two men with very different perspectives, and it's like a father just trying to relate to his son over a quiet drink. Um, I, again, how many movies would take the time to show stuff like that nowadays? I know, and it was kind of sad uh, for me. I mean, uh, that you know, he says, "Well, I'm here now. What do you want to talk about?" And they can't, they can't uh, figure out what to talk about, and, and that's kind of sad. You know, I mean, how many of us have? wanted at some point to be able to sit down with our fathers and and just just set aside the old dynamics the you know decades of dynamics and just relate uh as as people and can be very difficult and uh i felt i felt for them at that moment yeah um and it's it, it it's an awkward scene because like neither of them quite knows what to say or yeah. how to relate to each other and like there's there's clearly like a lot of you know f- resentment that's built up over a long time and yeah. Indy doesn't know how to express it and his dad doesn't quite know how to respond to it but eventually it starts to come out and you know ultimately it kind of gets interrupted when they notice the, the airship's turning around um, because they've you know they're heading back towards Germany um, yeah and, and and so you know, like you don't quite get the resolution of that till later in the movie. Um, I also love the bit where where Indy has to go to to Berlin um, to get the Grail Diary from Elsa, uh, and it's one of those <laughs> one of those uh, you know one of the scenes of the Nazis burning books. Yeah, you know, uh, just one of those horrible like moments in history when they they were destroying everything that was like you know contrary to their ideology, um, and you know. Elsa's there and it's interesting because she's she's kind of disgusted with the whole thing you can see how upset she is just watching all of this happening yeah. um but that's when Indy corners her and manages to to get the, the grail diary off her um and fucking runs into Hitler himself <laughs> which is <laughs> gets an autograph in yeah the- <laughs> <laughs> because he's in you know he's in that uniform isn't he so yeah. so he can blend in uh, and yeah, like Hitler, uh, he, he runs straight into him and hit, and you know you're wondering what the fuck's going to happen here. And Hitler just puts his hand up and gets a gets a pen and just autographs the book for him. <laughs> <laughs> very witty. Off he goes. Very funny. Yeah, very funny. It's, it's yeah, it's it's crazy stuff. Um, but but Schneiderman also- did have tears in her eyes as uh, all this spectacle was going on, so it was interesting. That uh, you know, it gave her a little bit of, of depth there. Uh, yeah, she's kind of like Belloc. She just wants to, you know, it's a means to an end. You know, yes, she's not. She's not a Nazi. Um, she's more of a, I don't know. She's an opportunist, I guess. Pragmatist, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the 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 one guy I, I guess we've not mentioned is Donovan as well, who's um, who's really the the main antagonist of the story. I, I it's weird that I missed him out, but like. You know, he's already mentioned that. Um, you know, he he was. I think he was initially f- posing as a guy who was funding. Um, you know, Henry's research, like Sean Connery's research, because he wants to get his hand on the Grail. Because ultimately, he wants that that secret of eternal life. Um, because he plans to outlive all of them, um, and so he's he's kind of involved with all of this. And you you um, you eventually get to see him. They've they've 
located where they need to go to locate, sorry, to get their hands on the grail. It's like out in the desert somewhere. Uh, the Germans rock up in this country and they approach like the sultan or the ruler of the, the country um, because they want permission to go there. Um, and it they offer him all kinds of treasure and bribes and stuff. And it's not until he notices that the, they've got like a Mercedes um, car that they're driving. And they're like, yeah, you can have that. Uh, and he's like, yeah, cool. You'll have everything you want. Then you'll have desert provisions and troops and tanks and everything. And like, just gives them everything because he wants this car so much. Um, yeah. And so that's what that's what gets them on the, the right path. Um, and you get another great action scene where um, the Indy's got to fight his way onto this tank um, where his dad is being kept prisoner. Like he, him and Marcus Brody have been taken hostage by the, the Nazis and Indy's got to try and get them freed. Um, and yeah, that, that whole sequence is just fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, very well done. Uh, I think this script is uh, a very tight script, uh, very well uh, uh, linked script, and uh, it, it flows. It's it's quite well uh, crafted. Yeah, uh, I, I forgot to mention this as well. Oh, yeah. Um, for Brody, where he's like, oh, he speaks a dozen languages. Uh, but with any luck, he's found the grill already, and he's just like stumbling around, <laughs> like totally <laughs> fucking clueless, and he just gets picked up immediately by the Germans. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, but it was a good bluff by Indiana Jones. He was trying to uh, do that. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Another great, cool beautiful bluff. line. Beautiful line. Yeah. Tells me that goose stepping morons like yourself should try reading books instead of burning them. Um, yeah, it seems like exactly the kind of thing like a, a, a historian like Henry would say. Um, and yeah, so it, it, it kind of leads to that scene where like Indy's got to like rescue his father from the tank. And like, I, I love how, oh, again, like you, we talked before about how when you do these action sequences in the indie movies, you kind of have a great sense of spatial awareness. You know where all the characters are and what they're doing and how it mm -hmm. relates to everything else. Like, um, you know, there's bits where um, the, the the Germans are trying to pull up a, a, a truck next to it so troops can, like, leap on. And I think um, Sean Connery gets a hold of one of the, the Sponson guns and just fires it straight into the side of this truck and blows it up. Um, yeah, just great stuff like that. It's really, really well done. Like, Indy jams, like, a, a stone or a rock into, like, the barrel of one of the guns. So when they fire it, it backfires into the, um, you know, into the, the cabin of the tank. It's all yeah. it's all cool. I really like how that's done, um, and it eventually ends up in the tank going off the edge of a cliff, with with Vogel still inside it. And you think Indy's been drawn off it as well because he was like stuck on on the top of it just as it went over the edge. Yeah, um, and yeah, it, it's like he he crawls up the edge um, just as like uh, Marcus and and um, and Henry are like looking over like oh my god. Um, you know he's he's gone. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't tell him uh, anything. It would have taken just five minutes, you know. And and then Indy's there looking over their shoulders uh, and what they're looking at. Junior, you made it, and he hugs him. But then he doesn't say anything. Well, isn't yeah, that the way? Yeah, he's like, I thought I lost you, boy. Uh, yeah. But then he, he kind of like stiffens up, and he's he's just like, oh well, it's good that you're okay. And then like Indiana just drops to the ground like as the others walk away, and then his hat blows off over next to him. Which I loved. It's like God returned his hat to him, which is yeah. a really beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, his hat's important, man. It's a beautiful hat. Yeah, it's it's just it's iconic for him. Um, I was going to say, can you bear with me just for a minute? Like I I have been drinking quite a bit this evening. I need to go for a piss. Um, could, well. Could you I Absolutely. What? What? Uh, actually, I've been drinking quite a bit as well. I might historically have to go for one as well. So uh, why don't you? Uh, oh, I'll, do, I'll you do you want to go first? Do you need yeah. to go? Uh, no, go ahead. I'll I'll hold the fort here, and then uh, you can do the same for me. All right, cool, man. All right, I'll be back in one minute. All right, I'm going to set up a little bit about uh, uh, Crystal Skull, folks. Uh, so I have to confess, I've only seen Crystal Skull once. I saw it uh, fairly recently, 
somebody uh, had, had been kind enough to send me a Blu-ray of Crystal Skull. I had eschewed seeing it the first time because I was not interested in seeing, you know, shit LaPouf uh, take uh, Indiana Jones' place as his son, you know, mutt. Uh, I heard that it was just utter shit. And I try to avoid seeing movies like that that will, uh, you know, intrude on my mental dojo and kind of um, taint my perception of the original or the characters or so on. So finally, I just said, all right, you know what? Uh, I'm okay. Let, let's just watch this thing. And I, I put it on and I was bored out of my mind and I fell asleep for maybe about 20 minutes. So <laughs> my recollection of Crystal Skull is uh, rather uh, impaired. Uh, obviously, I did not care for it. I, I thought it was... <sighs> It was pretty lame. So uh, I think that uh, in this discussion, there will be gaps. It will not be as thorough as my knowledge of the other three uh, movies, the masterpieces, if you want to call them that. Uh, so I was just confessing about uh, Crystal Skull here, Critical Drinker. Uh, oh, yeah. That, you know, I fell asleep for about maybe 20 minutes of it. So uh, my, my recollection was a wise move. That was a wise move. <laughs> it was better. So if you'll excuse me, I'll be right back. All right, cool, man. Uh, yeah, well, since I'm here, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> that was a quick piss. Yeah, I don't fuck around, man. Uh, I, I'm pretty lucky. Like, I've got a bathroom that's like right next to my office here. So, yeah, I could just get in and out. No, no messing. <laughs> um, what is the next one? Lighting in the bottle they could not catch with Crystal Skull. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they did it three times, to be fair, so I think that's pretty fucking good. Uh, but with Crystal Skull, they absolutely lost it. I don't know if this is just what happens when you've got too much resources and too much money at your disposal. Um, yeah, I muted the mic so you couldn't hear me like shouting and, and crying and uh, laughing hysterically as I was pissing. So, yeah, it's probably best that you don't see that side of my personality. Uh, did I wash my hands? I did actually. Yeah, they're still wet. <laughs> I didn't want to fuck around and like waste your time, so I wanted to get right back into it. Um, Tatiana is quick. Well, she's pretty experienced. Let me put it that way. Um, King Th King Tudor, I'm a big fan, man. Thank you, man, and I'm a fan of you as well. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, if you thought in Crystal Skull was bad, wait until Indy Five. Yeah. Fuck, man. Just that movie. Why are they doing it? Why? This is this is Kathleen Kennedy, man. She just wants to get one more jab in there before she gets knocked out. Um, it's, it's tragic. And it's, you know, they talk about the male fucking ego. It's got nothing on her, dude. Um, Crystal Scott was duty and not the sexy Allison kind. Yeah. <laughs> What a shit surname. Like, for a beautiful woman, Alison Doody. Um, yeah, it's not Indy 5, it's Waller Bridge 1. Fuck, yeah. If I was to pick someone who, who was going to be like a, a kick-ass, rough-and-tumble adventurer, like Phoebe Waller Bridge would be like right at the, the, the like last 1% of my list. Like, I just can't think of a worse actress to be playing a role like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. Yeah, yeah I, I'm you? not thrilled. I'm not thrilled. I thought I'd lost you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I can usually go uh, uh, six, seven hours uh, on these live streams uh, without taking a leak, but I've just been tossing back this uh, log of Yulin 16 like it was mother's milk. I don't know. I'm just in the mood yeah. to drink heavily. I said uh, on Twitter that, uh, you know, likely it would be... Uh, drunken I, I, this, i've had like three thing, glasses like, well this is the thing like when we've done this stream like i get to go off to bed but you've then got to do another one after this so yes i have a damn, members man. only uh live stream at, at uh yeah the, later this evening just a little bit later i have enough time to eat and then i gotta get on so uh yeah well shit i i'm still lucid i'm, I'm not slurring am i i don't think i'm slurring. well no no you're, you're you're hanging in there so far let's let's make use of it let's see if we can finish up this indie trilogy um yeah, like so, they managed to make it to like the the um, location where the Grail's being held, and 
you you get to see that like the the Nazis have got there just before them. So like they send in like one of their their soldiers, who I'm pretty fucking sure is the same guy that got set on fire in in um, Temple of Doom. He did look who's... like him, didn't he? I think it's the same actor. Yeah, like the one that got his heart ripped out. Wow. Um, yeah, but anyway, he gets his head locked off by this thing. So they're like, yeah, we need another volunteer to go in, um, and that's when when Indy gets discovered. Um, and they, they end up like Donovan shoots his dad to give him more incentive to get in there and, and like find a way through these traps. Oh, yeah. uh, I just heard the cork going off your whiskey there. Yeah, such a good I'm sorry. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Oh, this is a good <laughs> hey, this there log of mule is, is uh, beautiful stuff. And it's just a great excuse. Uh, it's been a, a shitty couple of weeks for me. Uh, so uh, this is a, oh, shit, I'm sorry, it's man. been a lot. Nah, man, this has been so much fun. I, there's nothing more el elating than talking about great cinema uh, yeah. with an intelligent person. And uh, well, you got just... half of that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so cheers, cheers, yeah, cheers, cheers to you. Dude. Oops, go. scumbag. Oops, scumbag. Um, yeah. So Indy's got to make his way through these three different traps, and like the first one is like the the the, the uh, way of God. So only the penitent man shall pass. Mm -hmm. The penitent man. And so a penitent man has to kneel before God, and that's what gets him through these blades that just, they magically sense that you're there, okay? So we've got motion sensors back then, so all right, it's cool. Well, you know, uh, actually, I've thought about this, Critical Drinker. I think it's magic. Uh, I, I, I think it's magic, and I think it was magic in uh, the cave with, uh, you know, uh, Forrestal in, in the very first indie, because there's no mechanism. What, do they have light sensors that, you know, you yeah. block the light? I think it's a spell. Yeah, it's got to be something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's um, yeah. Either way, he's able to, like, duck and roll his way through it, um, and he's able to jam up the mechanism so the rest can get through. Uh, then it's the word of God, and so he's got to, um, what is it? He's got to, like, spell out Jehovah, but it's in Latin, <laughs> so he almost dies doing it. And, uh, and, and uh, Henry, uh, you know, dad, senior, uh, is lying there. It starts with an I. And, of course, yeah. he can't hear it. And, you know, and he almost damn near plummets to his death. That was really well done. I love this one. The penitent man must roll, too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky, the good point. Lucky he knew how to do that. Lucky yeah, he knew how to do it. I thought the same thing. Oh, thank you, El Paradiso. Yeah. Whatever it is. Um, I, I, the, the, the one that I always liked was the, the, the one where he has to make a leap of faith. Oh shit. Because... I couldn't have done that, man. No, uh, no way. No way. Um, but it's one of those weird visual things where I think, um, it might benefit from a wee bit of a, a modern remake or at least a bit of a retouch just to make the, the visual effects line up a little bit better. Cause it is slightly sketchy how they do it. But it's basically like a, a a a pillar that sticks out from the other side of this this chasm. Um, but it's designed to look like it's just part of the cliff, so you don't see it until you step onto it. And so you've just got to like step out and hope for the best. So right. leap of faith. Uh, but Indy does it because he loves his father and he doesn't want to see him die, and so he's willing to to risk everything for a chance to save him. Um, and again, a great, a great little character moment for Indy. He's got no idea if this is going to work. It isn't the option. It's just, just try it and hope. I, you know, I think a better approach would have been uh, to have the entire chasm spanned by a length of uh, non-reflective glass. Yeah, uh, maybe about three feet down. Uh, you know, and, and just make it so that, okay, it's very clever, some kind of old technology or something. So you really, and you are going to fall, but it's only going to be about three feet. And then, cause it showed the, the, uh, grail in the, in the, in the journal, it showed one of the knights walking across air. Yes. And, uh, and so that would have been, uh, I think more, more reasonable structure, than uh, than the the weird chasm that's painted to look exactly. I mean, what you don't shift around, you'd see it. You'd see it pretty easily, I think. Yeah, especially like considering it's like a thousand years old, so it would be weathered. Yeah, so, yeah. It's a, it, it, but you know what the hell? Okay, I mean, it was the the dramatic aspect of it is that Indy had to make a choice to make a leap of faith. That's the the story value of it, and the mechanics of it are not quite as important, but. 
I would have yeah. done it as, as a, like a big pane of glass or something or, you know, yeah. or shit, maybe just the magic of God, you know? I mean, what if, what if there's nothing there and you're just floating uh, and, and it was beyond explanation? That would have been interesting. Yeah. No, I think either way is fine. And like the point is that he, you know, Indy is willing to risk all of this for his father. Yeah. And, and a chance to save with him. With time so running. Yeah. 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 So I'm fine with that. Um, but it ultimately leads him to the, the grail room where the knight tries to attack him. And like, this is a knight that's been there for hundreds of years because he's, you know, he's uh, taken the, the grail um, himself. And so it basically grants you eternal life or something close to it. Um, and so the others come in and, you, you know, the, the final challenge is that you have to pick the, the correct grail out of all these, you know, hundreds of goblets and decanters and everything that's that's lined up on the walls you've got to find the right one yeah um, i think it's elsa that picks it out for for donovan um and gives him what she believes to be the correct one and he he drinks from it uh and that's when you get that that awesome scene and it, it's very much like the first movie where it's like horrifying at the same time and like when you're a kid it scares the shit out of you but he, he rapidly ages and you know you get this great stop motion animation scene of, of like him his face like turning into an old man and his hair growing really long and then it like it just kind of like turns into a skeleton decays right in front of your eyes yeah uh, it just basically crumbles to dust uh, and it's it's it Indy who have who finds the correct grail which is just a clay cup just yeah. the, the simplest uh, thing because his question that he asks himself is what would a carpenter drink from? Like the right. son of a carpenter, sorry. And that was meant to be. Yeah, It's just like a simple goblet, you know. But I would, I think that Elsa picked deliberately the wrong. Yeah, I think one. she did. She absolutely did. I think she did. gave it to him uh, and gave, yes, because uh, gave, gave Indy a look. Uh, to kill Donovan, that yeah, yeah I, I think uh, her repugnant for the damn Nazis uh, uh, came out in that in that scene. Yes, uh, no, the, you're absolutely right because when when Indy talks about like what would the the correct grail be, like she's totally on board with with what he's actually looking for. You know, she gives him some hints that might help him because she actually wants him to find the correct one now. Uh, so yeah, I think she absolutely like helped them in the end. So she can she kind of came good, I suppose, as a character. Um, and then when they finally do find the correct one, um, it's Indy who drinks from it and it doesn't kill him. So he's again willing to risk everything. Um, uses it to heal his father. Um, and the the problem is that they try to then take the Grail beyond the seal that marks the boundary of the the temple, and that's when it starts like a giant earthquake that begins to destroy the place mm -hmm. and like ground opens up around them and stuff um, and it leads you into that scene where we talked about earlier where you know Elsa falls into a, a you know chasm and Indy's holding her up she's trying to reach for the grail because she wants to get it like she she's desperate to to save it from being destroyed and she ends up dying she falls right in because Indy can't hold on to her um, and then he's put in the same position um where, where he's he can almost reach it but not quite and his dad has to be the one to tell him to let it go it's not worth dying for um yeah, yeah which is a, a, a an incredible moment for both of them because this has been Henry Jones obsession his entire life uh, largely his entire life since since before Indy was born he was making notes in the 20s he was making notes and uh, for him to let it go means he valued his son more than the Grail, which uh, yeah. is a is a major major moment. Well, it's a great character arc for him, for a yeah. guy who was always a bit dismissive of his, of his son, and you know he's always had this strained relationship. And now realizes the importance of him, yeah. uh, and that's enough to to bring him back from the the brink. And so Indy lets the Grail go and. You know, his dad's able to pull him up and they're able to escape the temple. Um, and it just, the movie ends with like the, the best way you can end a film like this or a series like this, the, the three of them riding off into the sunset together. Yeah. Well, it's four, right? I mean, it was Sala, 
uh, all of them, Bro- Brody, Sala. Uh, yeah, and, Sala and as well. Henry. I keep forgetting yeah, about yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful ending. And it turned out that uh, Indiana was the name of the dog, uh, much like, uh, you know, Chewbacca was uh, George Lucas's dog. Yeah. Uh, and, and he you named, named the, uh, the Wookiee yeah. after him. <laughs> you named after a dog? I like that dog. Uh, and, and so yeah it's uh yeah i just think that that was a great way to end the the, the whole the whole trilogy um yeah there's interesting talk about elsa like you're like someone saying uh something uh, saying that she was always good i don't think she was necessarily strictly good or evil i think she was um uh, kind of in between she was an opportunist um mm-hmm. and she was definitely out for herself but she wasn't a bad person necessarily but like her her desire for the grail and all the the fame and glory it would have brought her um was what killed her in the end uh, yeah one thing i don't quite grasp is um so are is indy and henry uh now immortal i mean uh they drank from the the grail yeah. i mean it didn't say that they couldn't leave the boundary they just couldn't take the grail out of the boundary i i don't know I think that the immortality only works within the boundaries of the the temple. Uh, it was because the you know, Indy well, was that's able a to shitty deal. Immator- immortality. <laughs> it, 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 it is, uh, I, it is, but it only works in the context of like the next movie where you see that Indy's older and his dad's passed away. Like if you hadn't seen that, you might have thought, well, okay, maybe they'll live forever now. You just well, maybe you, it was a bad idea to make that movie. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the better <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, oh my god! I that uh, that damn movie. Dude. I was just like, okay, I'm in the right mood. Uh, you know, someone was kind enough to send me this this movie. I think it was Naruto Takikun, uh, and um, so I, I said, okay, I'm in the mood. Let's just watch a bad Indiana. Okay, so what? How bad could it be? And I put it in, and I and I watch it, and uh, I get very rapidly uh disaffected and uh kind of bored and then i think i fell asleep for maybe 20 minutes one of those things where you catch yourself nodding and you force your eyes open and then you go down again and uh uh i don't know it was not uh it, it was a complete misfire i i think with with kingdom of the crystal skull um i almost god christ i almost don't want to talk about it but um we'll just skim it maybe yeah we'll just skim over the top fuck it uh because no one wants to hear us talk about it <laughs> i don't think um it, it it really much it felt like um a movie that people made it because they felt like they should you mm-hmm. know it felt like nobody's heart was really in it um you know george lucas was very much moving away from from being an active writer and on movies, um, Steven Spielberg felt like he didn't really want to do it, and he was kind of getting older. It was like, yeah, it was like a reunion for a TV show that was long since past its prime, and none of the actors really cared that much about it anymore. Um, and yeah, I just everything just felt a bit off with it. Um, the the whole idea of doing aliens, I didn't care for in the slightest, you know. Um, as we talked about before, again, the first three movies they all they all covered like major religions, which I think was great. You know that everyone, every one of those religions got their fair shake in, mm-hmm. in the movie. Um, and aliens just felt like a weird, out of place thing. I think they couldn't work out like the chronology of it. They were trying to work Roswell and shit into it, and but they didn't know how that worked with like the crystal skulls. Um, yeah, like the, so in chat they're saying here, they weren't aliens, they were time travelers. No, they were interdimensional aliens. Like, I, I think they were just pulling shit out of their asses at yeah. this point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, but the thing is, uh, you could make a case. Because uh, there was uh, a script earlier, a script called Indiana Jones uh, and the Saucer Men. Mm. Uh, and you could argue, you could make a case uh, intellectually that, you know, You've got uh, Judaism, Hinduism, Catholicism, and science. The Scientology. Fourth, the you got fourth Scientology. religion. Well, no, not <laughs> science, but science. Uh, and, you know, the 50s, uh, you know, gee whiz, science fiction, uh, flying saucers. 
it, it could have it could have been theoretically if it had been done right a hell of a lot of fun i uh, but they did not even remotely do it right i mean you know once again we have you know nazis and well, you've got, you've got communists this time. Communists, yeah. Soviets. I mean, the same same damn thing. Uh, yeah, basically. You know, and 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 uh, it it could have been. I, I the movie I had in my head, like when I just saw it, even though I knew, you know, shit. Lapouf was in it as a mutt, and uh, his son, and I was really disgusted at the idea that maybe they were going to try and make him, you know, the torchbearer of of uh you know the the franchise moving forward i didn't want to see it i knew marion came back i didn't really want to see that degraded and so i skipped it for a long time and then finally just decided to watch it and it was just a complete nothing burger it was a, a big disappointment boring uh and and completely mismanaged whereas it could have been a lot of fun, you know, playing with, you know, 50s tropes, kind of make it like Iron Giant was so cool, you know, set in the 50s. I, I think, yeah, the, the the 50s was probably the last era that you could get away with that Indiana Jones type character yeah. and still have it work. Um, I, I did like, you know, the kind of chase around the museum, sorry, the, the university campus on the motorbike. I thought that was pretty good. Um but yeah, the, the over-reliance on CGI was unforgivable. In a series that had always been about stunt work and practical effects, that was such a waste. Yeah. Um, I, I felt like I never quite understood the point of the Crystal Skulls. I never understood what they were meant to represent. It was all a bit iffy. Uh, the plot, the script didn't even seem to know really what they were trying to do with it uh, or what point they were trying to make. Uh, I thought Shia LaBeouf was a bad choice. Like I know he was Flavor of the Month back in like 2008. Nobody gives a fuck about him now. Um, but the the only the only saving grace I'll give this movie is that like there's a little hint at the end that that Shia's going to try and you know pick up the mantle of being Indiana Jones when he takes the hat and and then Indy just takes it back from him and he's like no fucking way kid you're yeah. ready for this yeah that was that uh, was good. I, I like that. I think that was a nice way to end it. Um, yeah, and, and Kate Blanchett did her best. I, I thought she did a reasonably good she, job with a lousy script. She's a good actress, but yeah, the character they gave her was pretty crap. Um, yeah. And the fencing scene with her and Mott was was garbage. Um, and I hated Mac. Like, I don't know how Ray Winston keeps getting jobs because he just like the, the performance he turned in with this was just garbage. Uh, I don't. I didn't get the point of Mac at all as a character. He's just there to betray everyone. Yeah. And I just felt like he was a, a he was a fifth wheel basically in a show, in a story that absolutely didn't need him. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was kind of embarrassing. Uh, and uh, I was gonna say uh, uh, that thought just went out of my head. Uh, did you did you like the nuked fridge? Oh, uh, the the monkeys. In the nuke fridge, uh, God, that was that was so dumb. Uh, yeah. It was it was really dumb. And I got to say, the Temple of Doom moment where they jump out of a plane on an inflatable raft and survive uh, is is nuke the fridge in a, in a just a more primitive way. Yeah, uh, that was that was very badly done. That was very badly done. Yeah. Oh, as well, John Hurt. Yep, totally pointless in the story yeah. yeah no idea what the fuck he was meant to be doing in it uh he was just there um yeah what are you a triple agent <laughs> yeah mac <laughs> absolute joke um yeah yeah it was bad uh, boring pointless i mean at least marion and he got married at the end which was kind of nice but it Other was, but I mean, God, you know, Karen Aaron, Karen Allen was old as fuck by that point, and it's like, yeah, she just she lost her spark and her energy. She wasn't like the the exciting young woman that she was in in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, you know, I think you you lose something along the way, and she absolutely did. Um, the nuke fridge was just an excuse. They just wanted Indy silhouetted against that mushroom cloud. Yeah, that was that was literally all they wanted. Um, have a better <laughs> script. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, if you want to do that, find a find a better way to do it. For God's sakes, come on. Yeah, and it, yeah, the the whole movie just felt 
unnecessary. And I would have been more than happy if Indiana Jones had just ended with Last Crusade. I think you you maybe could have done a, a fourth one in like the mid nineties when Harrison Ford was still young enough to do it. And yeah, you you could have done interesting things with it. But by two thousand and eight, man, the dude was sixty five. Like he was getting on a bit, and now he's he's almost eighty. And we're talking about now doing a fifth Indiana Jones movie. Like, I genuinely help me out here, dudes. I don't know how this is meant to work. Well, and, and you said like the 50s was the last time that they could get away with it. Well, this is set in the 60s, uh, yeah. allegedly. Although the the shots of old World War II tanks and everything lends credence to the notion that uh, there is time travel in this. Uh, I've heard, yeah, I've heard you say this. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what a, a, I got a leak. Uh, from an onset source, uh, two months before all of these leaks uh, kind of sprang up on, uh, you know, in the New York Post and the Examiner and, and all these other, you know, websites and newspapers, uh, where where uh, someone else from the the set leaked to them the same type of thing, which is that uh, you know Indiana Jones is going to meet a young, uh, you know de-aged uh you know cgi deep fake indie uh and uh that basically they're gonna die uh in the past and and phoebe waller bridge is gonna basically take up the mantle moving forward now uh when all this shit hit two months after my my uh tip um mangold was was confronted with it on twitter and he denied it categorically which leads me to believe a, he's lying, or B, <laughs> or, or B, in this uh, hiatus, uh, gauging the response of of you know the, the public to these ideas, uh, they're revising it frantically uh, to to change uh, uh, you know uh, avert this course. I hope so because uh, it would be absolutely an abomination to have Phoebe Waller Bridge, uh, you know, take over his his uh, mantle in, in in the franchise moving forward on a disney plus tv series after the movie uh fuck that man no i mean the, well there's so many aspects of this right i don't like the idea of indie time traveling back to meet younger versions of indie like i know i mean that that's not what the indiana jones movies are about it's like the idea that they would ever work time travel into star wars or something like it was never ever part of that that canon or that universe like and i don't think how you can you can do that now um and yeah like when you're talking about potentially someone like phoebe waller bridge taking over as the role of indy right look at what indy goes through in these movies he gets beat to shit you know he's he's bruised he's battered he's he's um you know getting a kick in from everyone but he soldiers through um and he's kind of a wreck by the end of most of his movies you you can't show that kind of thing happening to a woman no you, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't be allowed to and so what's the solution here she just kind of wins everything immediately. yes yes uh, well that's know, the that, woke agenda i mean uh that's that's exactly it yeah and that's the there's no tension then because the character doesn't go through anything um and you know the great thing about harrison ford is he can pull off that kind of um, academic version of indie where he's he's a history professor at university and he's got the glasses on and everything uh, but he can also be the kick-ass adventurer who who's who's able to take on anything and, and, and go through these most you know insanely dangerous situations and make it out the other side i couldn't see someone like phoebe waller bridge doing that she can definitely play the the geeky academic type but i could not see her being the adventurer no, mm -mm. Uh, and, and you know her thing is mainly comedy. Um, I, I I don't think this will come to pass. I think that they are rethinking it. I think his denial, of course, you know denials mean nothing. Uh, since remember that J.J. Uh, Abrams said uh, in Star Trek Into Darkness, oh no, this character isn't Khan, being played yeah. by uh, Cumberbatch, <laughs> and, and totally no, is it, Khan. It, it totally was uh, utter and complete lie utter and complete lie and uh kevin smith saying oh no 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 uh my masters of the universe revelation is uh absolutely uh focused on he-man and of course it was all about tila and they kill he-man twice so 
Yeah, that was just <laughs> ridiculous. Um, someone pointed out here, Lara Croft. Um, yeah, she's, I mean, she's tangentially related to Indiana Jones in the sense that they're both archaeologists. But, like, again, she doesn't go through the kind of, um, you know, abuse that Indy does. Not not the Lara Croft from the original games. Like, the new one, yeah, they, they definitely ramp that up. Uh, but in the original game, she was always kind of in control of the situation, and uh, she was much more of a suave sort of debonair, almost like a female James Bond crossed with Indiana Jones. Right. So, like, kind of a different character. Uh, but she was fucking awesome. Loved her back in the day. Uh, Absolutely. But, yeah, I, I just... I, I just don't want to see this movie get made. Um, I don't want to see old, old Harrison Ford um, trying to hobble around and, and trying to be a, a, an adventurer again. Like he, he was in a, an otherwise shit movie in Crystal Skull. Like for a guy who was in his mid sixties, he was in incredible shape. Like yeah. if he dyed his hair a little bit, like he would have looked much as he did in the original trilogy. Um, but yeah, like his time has passed now. He can't be doing stuff like that. Kind of like Clint Eastwood actually, with with his with Cry Macho, where he's like a cowboy and he's throwing punches and stuff. Like you're 91 years old, dude. Like you're not you're you're too old for that kind of thing now. You know. And as much as I fucking love Clint Eastwood, and I've got nothing but respect for his incredible career, there definitely comes a point where you have to hang. You know, you have to step back and just say, yeah, I'm done with this now. Yeah, I mean, I you have to back. go. Yeah, you have to go with it as uh, you know John uh, John Wayne and the Shootist. You know, I mean, have a, a guy at the end of his career, uh, a guy who is uh, fighting time. Uh, you, you can't have you know Clint Eastwood throw. I mean, I was just listening to him, like in the trailer, and his voice sounds so <sighs> off. Uh, I, I love him. I absolutely, I think that the, the two greatest Westerns ever made are Unforgiven and The Good, Bad, and The Ugly. So, you know, I've got nothing but admiration for Clint Eastwood as a director, actor, uh, person. Uh, but uh, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm glad that he made this movie uh, for fans, but it, it's tough. You know, and look at Patrick Stewart, for God's sakes. Uh, you know, waddling around is pretending to be Picard. Uh, in these uh, woke remakes, it's horrible. Yeah, it's like he just stumbled out in the nursing home. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm here to to save the Romulan Empire. Yeah, sure you are, Jean. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry that I didn't save the Romulans. Well, you know, shit. At this point, you should focus on saving your prostate because you are uh, you are crazy, yeah. dude. Where is it? It's like uh, the, one of the people here had said, like Indiana Jones and the search for his memory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone pointed out he's here like Stallone in the latest Rambo movie yeah but Stallone's like not 91 years old like he's considerably younger like comparatively I suppose yeah uh, and yeah he's still built like a brick shit house. so you know he's, he's kind of got a special pass I suppose um, but yeah I mean like Gran Torino was a fantastic movie but even yeah. that was like 12 13 years ago so that was a, that was a quite a while you know yeah um but yeah i mean overall man yeah like that that has been our summary of the indiana jones movies um well i was gonna say what a what a mostly beautiful franchise it is you know the first yeah. three fantastic like mm -hmm. up and down a little bit at times but overall like i could watch any three any of those movies and still enjoy them Fourth absolutely one, not so much <laughs> no nah, it was pretty pretty dull i mean i maybe someday i'll try and rewatch it just to see the 20 minutes i i fell asleep during but uh it's really not worth it. there's so many wonderful things out there still to watch that uh i'd rather not waste that chunk of my life but i don't know yeah not good here, here you go indiana jones and the race to the bathroom <laughs> 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 yeah yeah uh and when harrison ford got injured on the set, you know, I don't know, sitting down in a chair or something. I don't know what happened, but uh, yeah, it's well, just, he it's injured just a his problem. shoulder, didn't he? Um, and yeah, you know, again, this is the thing when you're almost eight years old, like you can't, you can't train and, and fight like a, a guy in his thirties or forties. You know, you you don't have that anymore, and you're going to get injured more often. And yeah, I mean, f fucking fair play to the guy for keeping it up and still, still yeah. trying. 
But yeah. I think by that point in my life, I would just be like, nah, I'm done. I just want to retire. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just, I just think have so. fun. Relax. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I know that uh, we, we obviously have quite a few super chats that have come in. I don't know how much time you've got left, my friend. but uh, Just a few minutes. But if there's some highlighted ones that you just want to, I got maybe about 10 minutes left. Okay. Oh, I'll see what I can do. Um, Stephen Lanuto said, Kale Drinker, covering one of the greatest film trilogies ever made, but we all know Last Crusade is the best. That's where we learned the best intel comes when she talks in her sleep. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, when you're Sean Connery, man, you can get all kinds of intel. Uh, Tucker Johnson, my glass is raised to you, Drinker. Thanks for covering my favorite three movies because there are only three, right? Right? Yeah, there are only three. Let's, let's just uh, let's go with that. <laughs> Jackson says last and third fuck off Johnson slash Lenuto always it was a trick I meant all white chick the one that looked like a spice girl spicy hot <laughs> what uh, okay uh, Dan Ronan says as a little kid I wanted to be indie so bad I tried swinging from my bed using the ceiling fan wouldn't you know I tore it out dad was not pleased <laughs> I'm not surprised man <laughs> worth it worth yeah. it RRTNZ, Hail Drinker, Pissed Prince of Prose and Lord Doomcock. After listening to your topic, sorry, Tropic Thunder stream, I'm re-recommending The Guard, possibly the last truly funny and non-woke comedy. Cheers. Uh, that is on my list because people fucking love that movie. So The Guard is like an Irish comedy, I think. I'm definitely going to watch that. Um, Kane Crow says, you call him Dr. Jones, lady. And yeah, The Guard is a great film. <laughs> uh, the Outcast Creative, Indy 3 opened the newly refurbished Empire Leicester Square, which surprised the 40 of us who went uh, with a laser light show. You can see it on YouTube. Fucking hell. Uh, yeah, back in the day. Love to have seen that. Um, yeah. Unhinged. The drinker and overlord talk Indiana Jones. My whip is obviously stiff. <laughs> da, 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 da. Outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Uh, Spitfire Mark 1, Raiders is my favourite film of all, making me many friends. One of my biggest thrills going to Herbert Johnson in London to meet the great, sorry, the gent that created the legendary poet hat. I still have that hat. Oh, nice. Nice, uh, man. Kit Kat, delighted to see Doomcock, my favourite YouTuber, and Critical Drinker, my third favourite YouTuber, are streaming together. Uh, my second favourite, Andre of Midnight's Edge. Uh, last time I was when Frolic ran into the morning and Drinker popped in. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that, actually. Fuck. Um, actually, we can go ahead and have a bit of Andre in this to make it perfect for <laughs> Kit Kat. So there you go. Now you're complete. Andre popped in, just to say wow. that. Uh, Doomcock, <laughs> the, that is a Frankensteinian abomination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love Andre. Like, he's great. Great. He's a fantastic. Great one. Fantastic. Hail we Kit Kat. Did, uh, we did uh, we did a Conan the Barbarian stream like a couple of weeks ago, and uh, yeah, he was great. Actually, we're going to uh, Andre and I are going to be live streaming for the first time together, uh, just that's the two of us uh, next uh, Tuesday uh, morning, I believe, at uh, like eleven o'clock in the morning. So uh, look, mark that on your calendars, folks. History will be made. Nice, I like it. Uh, Anti-derivative Jill says, Hail Drinker and Doom Cop. I love Marion's character. Very 3D, strong, smart, and sexy. But why do all the bars she owns have to be burned down? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's just the way it is for her. Tough tough break she's got. I think uh, she's smoking hot, and that's why. That's it, yeah. She actually sets the place on fire. Yep. Um, Charles Hurst gave me a $50 super sticker. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate that. Thanks, man. Uh, Morrigan says, we now have technology capable of depicting stories with any creature, character, concept, or world we can imagine, and all that Hollywood can give us is remakes. Yeah. Fucking tragic, isn't it? It is, and it's disgusting, and it's a, it's a crime against future generations who damn well may stumble into these inferior remakes and thus have uh, the original movies, the classics, spoiled for them uh, for all time. Yeah. Do you think people are like, you know, 50 years from now, they're going to look back on this period and just be like, 
wow, that was that weird, crazy time when everyone just lost their minds and didn't have any imagination. Glad we got past that. Yeah, I just hope that those uh, people saying that are actually people and not cockroaches that uh, actually (laughs) will still be around because I don't know, man. It's looking bad. It's crazy. Yeah, Um, Sentient computers or something. Yeah, no. James Bursey says, Oi, drinker, you literary rapscallion, get on down to Texas. I've got 32 varieties of boomstick, 40 kinds of whiskey, plenty of Tatiana wannabes. Hunting season is about to start, so plenty of barbecue. Are you named for the dog? Fucking right, sign me up. I'm there. Uh, that sounds like a perfect way to spend my summer. Uh, Jester of Roanoke says, What a great trilogy. Shame they only made three. Yup. <laughs> uh Happy birthday, Polly says, any plans for a Star Wars Visions review drinker? Uh, not really, based on what I've seen. Um, I'll just I'll let it pass me by. Like, I don't think it's it's worth kind of taking the time for. I um, did actually do a review of the first two episodes. Uh, I love the first one. So uh, if you want to check it out, it's on my channel. Cool. Uh, yeah, look up uh, Overlord DVD's channel for uh, for those reviews. Um, Alex Perez says, greetings drinker from Miami. This question is for both of you and Doom. If you could be placed in charge of one mega franchise, which one would it be? Ooh, uh, I'll, I'll Star Trek. First. Star yeah. Trek. Uh, I, would, I would love to save Star Trek. I would love to go ahead and return it to the ideals that Gene Roddenberry set and uh, good, solid story values, great characters, and get rid of this Kurtzman crap. Uh, that is just insulting. I mean, it's like an insult to the human race. It's an insult to the very idea of sentience itself. Uh, the stupidity of that thing is is off the scale. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'll be honest, I would probably make the same choice. Um, yeah, in terms of ones I could save, like much as I like Star Wars, I think Star Trek closer to my heart. And I just think it's got more imp- like more interesting, more important things to say. And I guess if I could save one of them, it would probably be that. Um, yeah. Just, I wish that was possible. Um, Dreary or Spider says, Indy might as well be played by Joe Biden for number five, considering he's going to be an 80 year old soy boy. Masculine characters never coming back. Uh, that's kind of what it feels like. Yeah. Not going to lie. Um, Chuck Grable. Hey, Drinker, there could be a three or four setups and payoffs in a story, or would that be too many and bog down the story? And can Tatiana make a roast beef with sauerkraut on rice sandwich? <laughs> I've never asked her for that one particularly, but uh, yeah, um, there could be as many setups as you want. Uh, I, I made a video about setups and payoffs. Um, you know, you can have one for every character. You can have two for every character. As long as they, they play a part in the story and they're woven into it, as many or as few as, as you need. Um, I, but as long as they actually play some kind of part, as long as they work, um, I, I'm totally fine with it. Uh, and it used to be that you really got satisfying emotional setups and payoffs or even intellectual ones where they just set up events in the story. Um, and I just feel like you, you don't really get that now. Things are just thrown at you and you're expected to just accept it. Um, and it just makes for a really dumb experience where it doesn't really doesn't really make an impact, you know? Um, yeah. Alex Perez, also, are you going to review the Star Wars original trilogy and prequels on stream, sort of how you reviewed the Rocky series? Um, I mean, I'd like to, but damn, that, that that's quite an undertaking when you're talking about, especially the OT. Yeah. You know, you, the, that's quite a responsibility to try and do that justice, and it's, <laughs> you know, I would, need to, I would need to get a hand-picked team of men. I would need yes. top top men for that one <laughs> well said well said <laughs> top men um uh, the next one son of henry says uh sorry give me a, a 20 new zealand dollar uh super sticker saying go thank you my friend and uh, stone cold's beer cooler says i remember my latin teacher had us watch all three indiana jones movies in class because it had latin words and roman themes in it it was all just an excuse to watch great movies in class <laughs> That's a cool teacher. (laughs) Yeah, he's a fucking legend. Nice one, man. Well, I I, I think this is about time where I've got to run. Uh, But I had a a wonderful time, man. Uh, Absolutely wonderful. Me too. And like, honestly, mate, I I really appreciate you coming on to do this. It's been been a pleasure to have you on. And it's been a long time since you've been on the stream. So yeah, thank you for, for taking the time to do this. 
You're very welcome. Thank you for the invite. And I hope we can uh, do it again. Uh, I think I had a, a blast. Yeah. No, great, great stuff, man. And I will allow you to to head off and get some food before you do your next stream. But um, yeah, I will say like, please for, for everyone who's watching this, um, subscribe to Overlord DVD. I'll put a link in the description um, when I, when I upload this, but yeah, uh, produce some great content, really interesting insight to what goes on behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's great to have you on man. And uh, we will absolutely do this again sometime. Let's make it happen. Let's stay in touch. Uh, hail critical drinker and hail to all of those in the chat. Uh, we'll, we will see you next time. Take care, you guys. Thanks, man. Thank you, brother. We'll see you later. All right. All right. Doomcock has left the building, so it's just me. It's me. I'm going to do my best to keep you guys entertained for a little while. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get through all the super chats um, this evening, uh, in which case I'll just need to do like a, a catch up stream, but. I will absolutely do a few more, and um, I'll keep going until my liver packs in. Uh, all hail Tatiana. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Uh, right, let's see, let's see what we've got for the next one. Um, Alex Perez says, I also saw your review of The Outpost from a while back, and I recommended you watch Lone Survivor. Yes, I've watched that one. Another unforgiving war film that pulls no punches. Yeah, yeah, the bit where they roll down a, a mountainside and like you can just hear their bones breaking as they go. God damn it, that's painful. Uh, but yeah, great, great war movie. Action Com says, would you ever want uh, to be Indiana Jones? Maybe not to that extreme, but actually go someplace and have an adventure, not read about it on the internet. Yes, isn't everyone? Like, I mean, man. That, that, that's what you want in life. You want to go to interesting places. You want to like see, you know, un, unexplored places. You want to, to experience new things, you know, uh, maybe have a bit of danger. You know, that that's part of the fun of it. Um, yeah, I'd absolutely want to do that. I wouldn't want to necessarily like get exposed to like the, the Ark of the Covenant and like have my face melt off or anything. But yeah, like it'd be great to, to, do more traveling, I guess, because damn, not been able to do that for the past two years. Um, but yeah, once the, once the the travel restrictions are lifted, I absolutely plan to get out there. Um, Peter Street says, "Hello, drinker. Now that we're talking about Spielberg and remakes, what are your thoughts about the new West Side Story movie? Um, I know that it's, uh, I know that it's getting made. I don't know a huge amount about it though. I mean, I've seen West Side Story like." In, in stage format, I've seen it performed live and everything, and it's all perfectly fine. It's good stuff. Um, don't know how I feel about seeing a movie of it, to be honest with you. Um, Nabor605 says, Doomcock and Drinker, a surprise, but a welcome one. Yeah, it was great to have him on. It was it was a real pleasure. The Craig Lee Lawrence experience, when Indy 5 comes out, we all got to play Spot the Double, since it seems like even Harrison Ford himself might not actually be in the movie much either. Yeah, I've heard about that. He's got he's got uh, stand-ins and stunt doubles galore. Um, yeah, uh, critical drinker. Many have been asking for over ninety minutes. What are you drinking, you loquacious and viper of potent potables? I am drinking tonight uh, Woodford Reserve. Oh, I'll hold it up there so you can see it. Uh, yeah, nice bourbon goes down smooth. Perfect. Uh, good for a, a situation like this. Uh, there's no remake to West Side Story. It is perfect. I agree. Um, next one. The Top 10 Den. Breaking news. Harrison Ford replaced by strong female in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Tampons. <laughs> Don't fucking say it, by the way. They'll make it. Uh, Mexican Iron Man. Hail the critical drinker. Hail my overlord. It's my two favorite Scotch drinkers on one stream. Oh, happy days. Cheers. Thank you to Mexican Iron Man. I appreciate that, mate. Uh, Chad Peterson, Chad, you absolute Chad, you. Uh, Hail Drinker and Doomcock, looking forward to you fine gents discussing my favourite trilogy. Personally, I love the tank scene in Last Crusade, as do I, but I'd love to hear what you guys consider to be your favourite action sequence across the films. Cheers. Um, I think it could be the truck chase in um, in Raiders of the Lost Ark. That is brilliant. Brilliantly staged. You, you understand exactly what's going on. It's got lots of different elements at play. Uh, I think that's great. I love the flying wing fight sequence as well. Uh, again, in Raiders, I just think that's that's um, got lots of elements to it. It's got the ticking time bomb of like the gasoline. Um, yeah, 
just both of those are just fantastic. Uh, X Wing says my two favorite YouTubers. One is the mind, and one is the heart of pop culture. <laughs> I don't know which one's which. Genuinely, uh, the top ten. Then more breaking news: the arc replaced by strong females toolbox because she knows how to use tools. <laughs> of course, uh, Vet Wolfpack. Drinker, please review Equilibrium. It is on my list, believe it or not. It is because um, I think there's interesting things to say about that film. Um, also from the top 10, Den, even more breaking news. Religious allusions to Christianity, Hinduism, and Judaism replaced with new religion, feminism. Yeah, uh, that's the all-conquering religion, as we know. Boomeranga72 says, Raiders of the Lost Ark is probably the best movie of the three, but The Last Crusade has one of the greatest movie endings ever. That ride into the sunset gets me every time. Love your work, Drinker. Doomcock has impressed me too. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. And yeah, what a great way to end the trilogy. I loved it. Uh, Craig Lee Lawrence experience. Could Marion outdrink the drinker? Nobody can outdrink the fucking drinker. If I'd been in that fucking bar with her doing that drinking contest, I would have drunk her under the table. And then the rest of the movie wouldn't have happened and it would have been shit. So it's good that I wasn't there. Ah, the Black Douglas says, Spielberg said only Sean Connery could be Indy's father. And Connery said, anything Harrison has done, I did and I did it better. Spielberg says, whoa, did this understand the part or what? <laughs> Absolutely. I love that fucking attitude from Connery. And I can totally believe that's what he was like. Um... What's the next one? Uh, Corey Diaz. Love what you do, man. Uh, love from California. Thank you, man. And uh, yeah, I hope you, you're you enjoying things in the Republic of California because, yeah, from what I've heard, it's a bit rough there at the moment. Uh, RRTNZ says, Saw Raiders in the 80s with Pops, um, a top three movie experience of my life. Agree with Doomcock. Raiders is the greatest of all time adventure film. Could drinker, I drink Marion. Have a shot of me to find out. Cheers. All right, I'll take a shot. There you go. Mm. oh god that's good um, yeah I'll need to get Karen Allen in here and I'll just fucking see if we can have a drinking contest Algernon Sydney says could the drinker please review Rob Roy and Braveheart yeah I think you asked me that last time I would happily review both of them so I will get round to it eventually Brian Dolan no the joke with Belloc is that they're drinking Arak essentially Middle Eastern moonshine the joke is my family label is that he's a Frenchman used to fine wine getting hammered on rock gun. Ah, okay. I didn't know that. Um, I thought that was from his vineyard, and that's why he was so used to drinking it. So, yeah, I consider myself educated in that case. Also from Bind Zolan, it's sarcasm, and Bellic is okay with her walking out because he's hammered. I don't think he is. I don't think he is. Um, AX9 says, listening to you two legends talking about epic movies while drinking a non-filtrated Sardinian beer. Cheers, mates. Nice one, man. And I hope you enjoy that beer. Uh, Goaty McGoatface says, to further Lord Cox's future Earth ruling endeavours, also suggest that Drinker does an episode on separate channel on books. Faust. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. I don't think there's that much of an appetite for book reviews. Uh, I'd love to do it, but I just don't think people are that interested. Um, Scott Nudd said, you spoke about the novelty of having Indy shoot the swordsman. In that same spirit, having him knock a guard out only to find out his uniform won't fit was a fantastic bit of trope subversion. It really was, yeah. Uh, it almost implied like Harrison Ford was getting a bit fat or something, which he clearly wasn't. But, you know, uh, yeah, again, I love that idea that normally when you knock out guards, like there's, it's like their uniform is tailor-made to fit you. And, like, yeah, they, it just didn't work in this case. It's great. Clarence Eugene, huge fan, great commentary. Have you checked out Malignant yet? No, I'm going to be watching that with the EFAP guys on the 3rd of October, so check it out. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Spider Extreme Gamer says, you should watch a show called Terriers. Uh, I think you'd enjoy it a lot. Really well-made story about two, two charming private investigators. I've heard mixed things about Terriers, if I'm, if I'm honest with you. Um, some people have said it's like the greatest thing ever. Others have said like it's really fucking flawed and the, the characters are complete assholes. So I honestly don't know what to think at this point. Uh, I guess I would need to give it a go. Uh, yeah. Hey, Drinker, would you please do a review of Constantine? Yeah, um... Good fun movie with Keanu Reeves, um, and I, I liked um, fucking what is his name? Oh, I keep wanting to call him Stellan Skarsgård, but he's not. Um, 
Yeah, the guy who plays the devil in it, he's really fucking good. He's one of those guys that's just in every movie. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, classic comics. The fly seems to go into Belloc's mouth because it landed on his lip, then flew away, but a few seconds were cut from the footage showing it fly off. Uh, 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 sorry. I like to believe that he swallowed it because he was that much of a professional. He was just like, fuck it, I'll eat the fly and then I'll do the scene. Uh, Don Key says, do me. Vers versimilitude is music to my ears. Uh, love you both. By the way, in 95, my friend wrote a fake indie script, uh, Indiana Jones and the Sons of Darkness. Check it out. Oh, yeah, it'll probably be better than anything that's in Indiana Jones 5, that's for sure. JJ uh, O says, aloha from Hawaii, drinker. Do you know the, what Tropic Thunder, Jurassic Park, and Raiders of the Lost Ark have in common? They were all filmed in Hawaii. I find it hard to believe Raiders of the Lost Ark was filmed there. I mean, I suppose the jungle scenes at the start, actually. Uh, do you have any favorite animated movies? Love and enjoy what you do. Um, yeah, in terms of animated movies, I mean, I, I really like um, Castle in the Sky um, as an anime. Uh, I love Metropolis. That movie just fucking breaks my heart every time when it gets to the finale. Uh, just a brilliant film. Um, yeah, those would probably be my choices. Um, some of the Disney animated stuff from from back in the day was great. Like when I was a kid, I loved Aladdin. I loved Lion King. Um, you know, stuff like that. I thought was great fun. Um, Thomas Chipperfield, my favorite eighties action character, made back when films didn't need a comic relief to be funny. Yeah, they they, they just wove it into the script. It was great. Um, Shark Dentures. Indiana Jones equals comedic action and actiony comedy. Yeah, um, they they never get so heavy and dark with it that you take it too seriously. But like, there's still stakes involved. Uh, but they they definitely have fun with it, so that's good. Uh, Pete Ward, high drinker and Doomcock, respect and have a great stream. Thank you, mate, and uh, thanks for the donation. Derek McManus, Kathleen says hello, Mister Doomcock. Also, hail drinker. Well, hello to you, Kathleen. Um, Steve York says. Hail Drinker, hail Lord Doomcock. It's nice to see the future ruler of Earth at an earthly hour for a change. Question, how much do you think the alphabet agencies are controlling the agenda lines coming out of Hollywood? I don't know. I think it's just fucking opportunistic, shallow idiots just trying to um, set their, their sails by the, the current wind that's blowing. Um, and they're just detached from reality, really. I don't think there's a big conspiracy or anything. Um, James McDonough says, Drinker, my fellow Scotsman, check out Malignant. It's not great... Uh, sorry, it's got great schlock camp and it's a great tribute to the Sam Raimi movies. I'm looking forward to seeing it at the start of October. I'll be watching it with EFAP, like I said. Uh, True Turner says, I'm going after that truck. How? I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. <laughs> Too bad the indie writers applied this scene to the whole last movie. Uh, yeah, I love that line from Indy, though. It's just, it totally sums up what he's like as a person. He's just like, he's not got a plan. He's just fucking figuring it out as he goes. Uh, Scott Knudsen. Spielberg did Jaws, Close Encounters, Raiders, E.T. and Temple of Doom right in a row. We'll give him a mulligan for 1941. I can't imagine a modern director ever imagining a streak like that. Nah. Um, Spielberg in the 80s was just on fire. Um, you'll, you'll never get something like that again. Um, Arc Mean, or sorry, Arc Archimenzi 2 says, Longtime fan drinker. I would like to know your opinion on the 1995 thriller Seven. Yeah, yeah. Man, what can I say about it? Um, in a nutshell, yeah, some really gory deaths. Um, I think Kevin Spacey is like nice and suitably creepy as the killer. Um, you you really felt sorry for Brad Pitt. I love the scene at the end with the head in the box. Um, yeah, like it all ties together in quite a satisfying way. I think it's it's a uh, it's an interesting movie. It's not exactly an uplifting film, but damn, like there's there's some pretty horrifying scenes in it. Um, I always felt bad for the dude who was like strapped to a bed for like a year, and he's still fucking alive when they find him. Uh, yeah, he just looks like a zombie or something. It's awful. Um, Token white guy says that fight scene. Uh, I think so. Just how human Indy is. That's what made him great. Is that he messed up and sometimes he needed help. Yeah, he, he did. Um, and that's what I think you, you wouldn't be able to do that with a, a female Indiana Jones because you would never allow a woman to, to need help like that. You would never be able to show her messing up and get hurt. 
Um, and that's, I think, the difference there. Louis Dadasis says, the fact that Belloc still believed he could make Marion fall in love um, with him, despite her being his prisoner kept in poor conditions without food and water, is a testament to the character's sociopathy. Uh, yeah, he, he was clearly a bit detached from reality. I think he thought that he could win her over by being the good cop to like the, the Nazis' bad cop. You know, I'll protect you if you just play along. Um but I think ultimately he he didn't care that much about her. He was just she was just a pleasant distraction for him. And really, what he wanted was the arc. That was what his entire arc was geared towards. Um, Claudia Rogajan says you can see Indy hanging on the the periscope when it's submerged when they are traveling, though it's barely noticeable. Um, <laughs> didn't see that actually, but man, that would make for a weird scene. Um, Jedi Master MJ says, here's $5 to remind you that Ellie is gay, by the way, just in case you forgot. I'd forgotten, you know, because the, the, the scenes that hint about it in the game are so fucking subtle, you would never know. Um, yeah. A Scotsman can get sunburn anywhere. Yeah, we fucking can, by the way. I mean, look at this. Look at this skin. Like... Yeah, if I go to Florida right now, I would just I would just burn like a fucking vampire. Uh, but when you're drunk, you don't care. That's the great thing about it. Um, yeah, too bad she was put into Crystal Skull in the just glad to be working category. <laughs> fucking Karen Allen. I think yeah, Red Letter Media said it best when it's like, ah, she got to escape from her toll booth for a few a few months to do this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see here. I think I'll just do a couple more super chats and then I'll maybe call it a night because I'm getting pretty drunk and pretty tired. Um, P, sorry, P Gombe says, in the Well of Souls, there are snakes everywhere except for the pedestal where the Ark is. The reptiles get repelled by the Ark. Yeah, that's a nice little touch there. Uh, again, every animal is fucking terrified of this thing. J.E. says, I like that the actual resolution of Last Crusade was Indy's father accepting him and calling him Indy. Only reason Indy dropped the grail. Yeah, when he calls, he finally calls him Indiana. That's a nice little resolution to their character arc. Again, nice writing. Set up and pay off. Isn't it nice when you see that? Uh, P. Gombe, in a deleted scene, the old man told them not to look into the arc. Ah, I didn't know that. Frozen in the 80s, there's only a few actors in Hollywood... When you hear their name, it just takes you back to your childhood and to simpler times. And Harrison Ford, along with Michael J. Fox, are definitely the two that do it for me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andre Jones, Critical Drinker, good to see you again. Doomcock, well met. This movie came out when I was a kid and I loved it. Harrison Ford was a badass back when. Indiana Solo, Deckard, yeah. He just played some amazing characters in his career. Um, Naked Frame says do a shot every time willie scott makes you cringe nah i'd be dead i'd be dead within the first half hour of that movie um yeah like i said i feel so fucking bad for the actress she must have been so pissed off having to just play a character that screams her way through the entire movie um but yeah she is hot as fuck so i'll give her that uh and kevin s says y'all are my two favorite just saying thank you um Temple of Doom is off kilter and dark, but that made it what it was. Like pulp horror. Yeah, you're, you're fucking bang on. India's less mature in this. Uh, I like, but I get y'all's points. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a weird movie, and I've definitely got mixed feelings about it. I, I recognize that it's fun and stuff, um, but it, it feels really different from the other two. Um, but yeah, man. Like I know there's there's a whole bunch of other super chats that are still outstanding. I will definitely get to them in a catch up stream um, well before next week. Like I'll do it over the weekend or something. Um, but yeah, I don't want to I don't want to rush through anymore and just give like one word answers to them. I want to give them the attention they deserve. So uh, I think it's probably best for me if I wrap it up there. Um, but I want to say thanks to all you guys. You know, you you've given me very generous super chats tonight. You know, you've been a great crowd. <laughs> For doing this stuff um hopefully you've enjoyed doomcock and i talking about these indie movies because man it's been great to go over them again um and yeah i i think i'll, I'll probably call it there but yeah like i say thanks to all of you guys for tuning in for this and um join me on the next happy hour or open bar whichever comes next uh, but for now 
that is all I've got for today. So I'm going to go away now.